Okay. All right. Well, looks like five thirty to me. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of June the 27th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. May I have a roll call? Council Member Fair. Here. Council Member Pearson? Present. Council Member Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisandi? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on the closed session item? I'm checking right now to confirm, and no, you do not have any speakers on the closed session item. We will now recess to the closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 p.m. to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. Okay, see y'all later. Not much later.
Okay, my clock says it's 630, so I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of June 27, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom app application. The city clerk will call on those who are signed up to speak when the item is called. So you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand electronically is best, and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Urine? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum. May I have a closed session report? Yes, Mayor Grisanti, members of the council, good afternoon. Um, we did have a closed session today to discuss a public employee appointment under government code section 54957 for the position of city attorney. And by a vote of three to two, the council has, uh, with council members Uring and Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein dissenting, has voted to appoint Trevor Russin as your interim city attorney. As I've mentioned to all of you, I have taken another job at a, a construction company in town where I'll be their general counsel. So I'm gonna be leaving the city of Malibu and I wanted to thank you all and the public for all of their support over the past 18 months. Um, you have a great city, a great council, and a great, great staff. So I wish you all well, and I will miss you. So that is thank the concession you. report. Thank you, John. I, I seem to have missed the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of, America of America and, and to, to the republic for which, for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. Hey. Okay. I'm going to before we approve the agenda I'd like to ask if there are any or have, have, how many people have signed up for 7C and 7D? Kelsey, can you tell me that? Yes, just one moment. You have three speakers signed up for 7C and seven signed up for 7D. There is some overlap between those two lists. Okay. Three and seven, okay. Is I, I was, I've received a call asking if it would be possible to hear 7C and 7D together and move them to the beginning of the agenda. And uh, Bruce, would you like to comment on that? I, I was going to move to do that before you spoke. So if that's a motion, I'll second it. Okay, we got a motion and a second to move 7C and 7D to the uh, beginning of the agenda. And would you like to have it? Oh, and combine them and combine them and that would be i guess that would be after 1a and 1b and before 2a oh i would just make it after the uh, public comment but but i'll defer to the rest of the council if there's a desire to make it absolutely first any uh thoughts from anybody on that i think it would make sense a to combine combine them um and b uh to put them after 1B. Uh, just, just, just to make sure I understand, you said 7C and D, is that what you said? It's, the, I believe the two it's school seven. safety items. Yes. Okay, I, I thought I heard it differently. Did I screw that up? Not necessarily. No, 7C and 7D. All right. 
Can we have a motion to approve the agenda, moving 7C and 7D to be heard immediately after 1B? Oh, we already I had that. I'll go ahead. All right, I I'll move. It, I think it was the order that we were just deciding. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, we got a, we've got uh, two motions. They've both been approved. No. <laughs> I think we're all clear that now what we're voting on. So Kelsey, can you take a vote, please? Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, oh, wait sorry, a minute. I see Steve Uring's hand. I'm sorry. You're, uh... You're muted, Steve. I'd like Harry. to ask you, we close the meeting today in honor of Harry Geisner, uh, the California architect who built the Wave House uh, out on the beach. I mean, the man, you know, it, the Washington Post headline was, California architect in tune with nature, and he certainly was. He designed the wave house on a surfboard when he was out in the ocean looking back at it with a, a grease pen. So uh, he and he's got you know he's his design influenced the uh, opera house in Sydney. So he's got a great reputation, and I think uh, we deserve he deserves some recognition. So that's acceptable. I like to propose that. All right. So. Can we approve the agenda and uh, with the stipulation that when we adjourn it, we're going to adjourn it in memory of Harry Gessner? Okay. And do we need a vote to uh, to approve the agenda now, Kelsey? Yes, if you're ready for it. I'm ready for it. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on June 17th, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on June 23rd, 2022. Thank you. All right. That brings us to ceremonial presentations and a recognition of the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu 2022 Youth of the Year candidates. Casey, are you present? Who do we have to uh, present to accept the certificates? We do have the Youth of the Year candidates here, and we'll uh, mute them after you read your comments so they can okay. say a few words. Okay. Since 1947, Youth of the Year has been Boys and Girls Club of America's premier leadership program, distinguishing and celebrating the extraordinary achievements of club members who embody the values of leadership, service, academic excellence, and healthy lifestyles. This year, the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu recognized four Youth of the Year candidates for their active membership in Boys and Girls Club of Malibu and outstanding contributions to their community, family, and school. They're all exceptional leaders of the youth in our community. On behalf of the city council and the entire Malibu community, I'm proud to present certificates of recognition to Irina Colombino, Jazz Abbey, Anthony Sanchez, and finally, Francis Molina, the 2022 Malibu Boys and Girls Club Year of the Youth of the Year honoree. As Malibu's Youth of the Year, Frances received a $2,000 scholarship. She is en enrolled to attend Oxnard College next year and aspires to have a career in the computer science or culinary arts. Congratulations to each one of you and thank you for your selfless dedication to the Malibu community and continued involvement in the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu. Bruce? I see your hand. That's a relic from earlier. Sorry about that. I'm sorry. Do any of the uh, honorees want to say anything? We are asking them to unmute right now, so they all should see a pop-up if they'd like Great. to speak. Great. Hello. Hi. Um, Hi, Arena. Hi, thank you so much. I could not be more grateful. And really, I could not have done anything without the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu. 
because they presented me with so many wonderful opportunities that helped me get where I am right now. So thank you to them. And thank you for you guys for presenting me this award. Thank you. Thank you, Irena. Would anyone else like to speak? Hi, everyone. My name is Francis Molina, and thank you for this. And it's something good hearing my name. And okay, I speak more Spanish. I feel comfortable speak Spanish. And muchas gracias por todo, por esta gran oportunidad, porque me siento maravillosa por esta oportunidad muy buena, y estoy muy agradecida con todos ustedes. Thank you. All right. Is Jazz or Anthony here? There's Jazz. Thank you so much for this award and to the Boys and Girls Club. It means a lot. Thank you, Jazz. And Mayor, I don't see Anthony in the meeting and I'm not seeing any raised hand from him. So I think that wraps up the comments. Okay, that brings us to item 1B, which is Southern California Edison Wildfire Mitigation Update. And we're gonna receive a presentation from Southern California Edison Government Relations Manager, Andrew Thomas. Hello, hello, Andrew Thomas here. Can you all hear me okay? We can hear you, Andrew. Wonderful. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Andrew Thomas. I am the uh, relatively new a government relations manager uh, for Southern California for the area that includes Malibu. I want to thank the, the mayor uh, for this opportunity to address the council and for uh, the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Uh, as much as this is, uh, we've worked together on vegetation mitigation with Steve. Uh, we were present, Edison was present at your recent Malibu Safety Expo. Uh, this in fact is my first address to the council, so I consider that an opportunity and an honor. So, Thank you so much for uh, the welcome so far and for today's opportunity. Uh, I am somewhat a challenge by having a Baptist background and the opportunity for a more Catholic uh, uh, address. So I will do my best to stay within a, a, a time frame uh, that was given. Uh, I do want to share that this uh, address is uh, maybe a highlight, if you will, a teaser to an address that will be done on July the 6th for a full address of our wildfire mitigation and also reliability uh, reports. I wanna thank uh, Susan Duenas for uh, the opportunity to uh, use that next opportunity to give a full uh, and more robust address, but I hope today will be helpful toward the things that we are doing to make uh, Malibu uh, energy efficient, uh, have a reliable energy, and also have a safe experience uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. You know, as you uh, have known, uh, Southern California has an expansive service area of over 50,000 square miles. Uh, we have 1.4 million power poles in that area. And we in fact cover a service area that 27% of it is in high risk fire areas, which is a designation that, that Malibu shares. Uh, with all that being said, uh, you folks don't live in 50,000 square miles. You live in Malibu and you wanna know what's going on to uh, protect and safeguard that area. So the address, uh, a little bit of which will be covered today, and a lot of will be covered on J July the 6th, we'll be attempting to address that. Do know that that expansive area that we have is a learning ground, it's a testing ground for us to learn more and be able to deliver uh, reliable energy in a safe way to the city of Malibu when we've done so. Uh, there are things that need to be improved, and we're using all of our knowledge and experience to do just that. Uh, next slide. The overall uh, gist of this address uh, complies with the wildfire mitigation plan that we are compelled to give every year. Uh, those plans were finalized back in February. Um, with everything that's being said about energy and conservation and the updates, the primary objective, obviously, is to protect uh, public safety. Uh, because everything uh, falls second uh, to that. Um, inside of the report that we'll give a little bit today and on uh, the 6th is uh, the efforts to do just that, hardening the infrastructure, bolstering situational analysis and capabilities, uh, and enhancing operational practices and harnessing the power of technology. Uh, so we continue to do that. 
We are aware, however, uh, that in doing so uh, with either uh, planned work stoppages, that it does create a challenge uh, that uh, comes to, to you as a city. And I definitely want to know, want you to know that that is something I, I, we, we take very seriously. So we do this work uh, with the utmost respect to the city, uh, the business, and the citizens thereof to do so uh, as quickly and as, as equitably as possible. Next slide. You know, this is just uh, a little bit of a, a, a picture of the scope of what we do from generation of power to transmission. Uh, our customer service e uh, efforts are something we continuously try to improve. Uh, we are uh, an, an, a utility, but we're also involved in conservation, and we believe in that. Um, and we are engaged across all levels to make this a better experience for everybody and also safe experience as well. Uh, next slide. The report that I'll share today and, and what we'll do later on is uh, really a comprehensive strategy uh, talking about how to prevent combat and respond to um, events that will go on. And uh, those are across three areas, hardening the grid, which encompasses ideas of uh, cover conductor, which is the overhead wire that you would see uh, covering that with insulation. So that is protected against uh, sparking and, and, and arcing. Uh, undergrounding, which is a, a, a more intensive opportunity to underground um, wires, uh, and then overall doing system upgrades. Uh, our discussions about um, wildfire or um, vegetation uh, mitigation is a part of our enhancing operational practices. We know that the canopy of Malibu makes it a, a much of what it is, a beautiful city due to its vegetation. And our discussions with Steve and others earlier this year was uh, going about that in conjunction with your arborists so we're not um, in, infringing on the natural beauty of your city. Uh, we also know that there's also the uh, nesting and other patterns that go on your city. So we are very much in tune and trying to be in tune with your city and the vegetation and the things that make Malibu what it is. We are now trying to use these new technologies, which you see a, a little bit of a drone there, to inspect uh, poles that are more remote. So it doesn't take as long to do inspections and also using switch uh, updates so that instead of shutting off an entire grid, when there is a challenge, we can sectionalize uh, that uh, uh, shut off. And then we're bolstering our situation awareness capabilities. If, if any of you watched golf uh, yesterday and then going into the past, uh, when I watched Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer, uh, they hit the ball and it went and the ABC would catch up with it at the end and you were just told there's the ball. Uh, if you watched golf yesterday, you saw the arc of the ball, the speed of the ball, the dimples of the ball, how it landed, the grain and everything else. And those technologies have improved the viewing experience of golf. Well, those type of technologies are also available to us to improve and understand patterns, uh, weather patterns. And, and all those things to help us mitigate uh, possible situations. So we are, are just like, if you will, ABC using technology to upgrade and make it a safer delivery of our, our, our utility. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, obviously, for those of you who, uh, who precede me, I've previously been with Pepperdine, so I've been in the area for quite a few years. We know that 2008 uh, taught, uh, showed us a lot and, and hopefully it taught us a lot. And from 2019, from the foundational strategy of hardening the grid, of bolstering our situation awareness that I mentioned, uh, coming to 2020 and 21, where we were looking to reduce the impact of uh, PSPS impact, uh, using aerial fire suppression, where we invested monies into some uh, services that can get uh, to some remote areas and mitigate fire expansion. Uh, to now in 2022, the upgrade of long-term strategies of hardening the grid, including reducing the impact and the length of PSPS events, we're constantly uh, becoming aware and learning how we can do a better job of delivering uh, the idea of energy to your city. Uh, next slide. Those tools include, as I mentioned before, cover conductor, which is somewhat of a smaller uh, picture there, but will be expanded on July the 6th to, to show that when you cover bare wires, you're really reducing a significant risk that is a cause when uh, anything from a squirrel, which happened recently in the city, uh, to uh, palm fronds and other things colliding into uncovered uh, conductor wires. So now we're looking at cover conductor uh, about 20, 2,900 miles have been installed uh, since 2018, and we continue to expand on that. Uh, fire resistant poles, when we're at your um, safety uh, event, 
a gentleman came out talking about uh, exit routes. And one of the things that can be challenging the exit routes is poles falling over uh, roads. And with a city like Malibu that has, you know, really just one or two major thoroughfares to get in and out of the city, that can affect uh, rescue and also evac affect um, evacuation. So we're doing things such as composite poles or fire resistant wraps that make those poles more resistant to fire. So not only are they are there to continue to deliver power, but also less resistant to falling and, and cutting off thoroughfares that again are needed for um, uh, rescue and also for ex uh, evacuation. Uh, we're learning about new devices so that if a, a wire does hit the ground, uh, protective devices that can do auto shutoffs. Uh, we're doing undergrounding, which you uh, all are familiar with, um, and also microgrids. We're testing one at San Jacinto High School to uh, learn from that experience and hopefully expand that experience to other places that can benefit from microgrids, which gives us a little bit of control uh, of, uh, of our, our power delivery. Uh, next slide. Again, um, the high risk, uh, high fire risk inspections and remediations. Uh, you have gotten phone calls at the city, and I thank you for taking them and, and, and delivering a, a proper response. But those drones are not looking for HAFA or any, anything else. We're not trying to steal uh, recipes from anybody. We're really just trying to do inspections of poles that are otherwise difficult to get to. And obviously, we can do those with manpower, but they could take much longer. One of the things that's interesting is when there is a power shutoff, to turn the power off, you, to turn the power back on, you have to ins inspect the entire line. And if that is a remote line, it takes quite a while to get to those remote areas. With drones, we can get to those places. So we thank you for uh, being a, a partner and sharing with your citizens the need for them. We try to do it as non-invasively as possible, and they do a great deal in mitigating finding poles that need to be replaced due to woodpeckers and other type of things. But uh, it is a great tool that we're using. Uh, vegetation mitigation, which you talked about, uh, you have a beautiful city. But, and we don't want to infringe on that, but when things fall into wires or impinge on them, that can be a threat to the entire city. And, and for a few branches, we don't want to have that happen. We are working with your arborists and everybody else to make sure that we're following the, the canopy uh, restrictions that you have. And I, and I hope Steve and others will attest that we're trying to cooperate and continue to do so. And then our last resort is PSPS, which over time we'll share on July the 6th that uh, we're hopefully having less PSPS events and actually PSPS events that are actually shorter in duration. So we're always working toward fewer and those that do occur that they're shorter in duration. Next slide. With all that we've done, there has been progress and uh, from 2011, uh, I won't read to every statistic on here, but it, it def definitely shows in percentages that we're exceeding uh, expectations as far as the goals we have set, their aggressive goals from doing everything from inspections to distribution and transportation lines to install and improving conduct, cover conductor. Um, as we talked about before, our hazard tree mitigation or management uh, to things such as uh, inst installing weather vanes and other monitoring devices. And as you saw at our um, safety day there in your city, deploying community crew vehicles, which go out and can provide everything from a charging station for a cell phone, which is very critical during an emergency situation, to water, to now we even uh, will be supplying them with uh, insulated bags. So if, uh, if uh, medication needs to be refrigerated, you can have that as a service. All these are available through our distribution and now announcing so that people know where those trucks and those centers are gonna be deployed in their city. Uh, next slide. You know, all these things are as valuable as they are available. And we're trying to continuously do things like the safety event to make sure the city and its citizens know about the ability to call customer service in the case of an issue, uh, how to stay informed to our website and how to get updates through our websites and other available tools and resources. We have given on the previous slide, which I won't go back to, but a significant number of uh, generators so that persons who have medical necessities can have those. But those are only as good as people know about the process of ac accessing those. So for those medical baseline programs and other rebates, we're always trying to get that information out to your city. Uh, next slide. And then obviously we're trying to do enhancements. So you as a city have access to the public safety partner portals. So you can go on and get updates to uh, any shutoffs that are planned or uh, real-time updates. 
uh, citizens can get access to the same information and go to sec.com wildfire address look out to see what the status of an outage is and again uh, hopefully if there is a ways to conduit this through the city to make sure citizens know about these opportunities to get information and be better prepared for the unexpected but also know that we're working to prevent and uh, be ahead of those challenges as well um, next slide so uh, I think I am uh, over the city about a minute and a half of time. So I do apologize for that. I'll figure that out. But uh, there will be a full uh, wildfire reliability update on July the 6th. Um, Susan Duanis, again, thank you for setting that up. And I'm sure she'll make an announcement so we can give details about um, other detailed information about upgrades and other things that are happening in the city. But I do thank you for your time today, for your attention. Um, I do put in the word Harambe, which is a Swahili word that essentially means let's pull together and uh, let's pull in the same direction. So definitely I want to be a partner with the city and support uh, the great things you guys have as a world class city and, and definitely want to keep it safe and, and bright. So thank you for your time. Obviously, I will yield to uh, any particular questions, but obviously more questions can be addressed and fielded on July the 6th. Thank and you, Mikey's Mr. Mayor. got his hand raised, and I'm going to raise my hand to speak afterwards. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm, uh, I made it after Karen. So, Mikey, you're on. Uh, hi, Andrew. Thank you for the presentation. I noticed sure. uh, quickly one of the slides went by. It showed a little graphic, and it talked about aerial uh, suppression assets. So, sure. I assume that means helicopters. Is that through LA County Fire, are you of your own, or how's what's, we, what's we, we did do a substantial? Thank you for that question. We did do a substantial um, investment of about eighteen million dollars for helicopters, and so they are available. They have been used, and in this July sixth uh, address, there'll be, uh, and I, I should have it right in front of me the number of times they've been used in local fires, the amount of millions of tons of ga uh, gallons of water and repellent or, or fire retardant. Uh, substances has dropped. Uh, they are in our um, arsenal and they are being deployed to um, hit those challenging places. I live in proximity to your fair city and I know when the box fires were there, hearing those uh, uh, helicopters overhead, you know, can be an annoyance on a regular day, but during those challenging times, it, it's a beautiful sound to know they're coming in and dropping that. So uh, more information, but we do have those as assets in our arsenal to fight uh, from above. I did not know that, so I assume they work in coordination with uh, County Fire? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, Karen? Yeah, Andrew, I just want to say thank you very much. And I was wondering if you could forward the link to this presentation uh, to okay. the city manager for distribution and posting on yeah. the website. Sure. What I'll do is this is an abbreviated version of the July 6th. So I was planning on delivering that to the city manager as a total presentation. So it, along with additional information, uh, will be available as well. There were a couple of slides at the end for references, but they have phone numbers and other things that you can also post so that the city has it and can make it readily available. Um, you know, you have that at the end of the slide, but again, it'll be delivered as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Andrew, for commenting. Uh, one of my uh, citizens sent me over this circuit reliability review for 2022. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically what the what it shows, and I could show, there's a chart that because of blue screen, nobody can see it. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, basically, the chart shows that since the Woolsey fire, the number of average minutes of sustained interruptions has gone up almost fivefold. And that's, uh, I, I'm perplexed by that since, you know, basically we got a whole new circuits out here uh, at that point. Uh, so that's one thing. And, mm -hmm. and the total number of outages has gone up about 40% in the last three years. Also perplexing to me. And, and we get three times the frequency of sustained power outages than the system-wide average. Uh, why is service here to the, to the residents look like it's getting worse, not better? Yeah, um, the idea of the sheet that you're showing, uh, and I 
kind of vaguely saw it, but do know that those updates will be in the reliability report. That's as the, as the person who gave it to you referenced that. That is the report that will be shared more in detail on July the 6th. Okay. Um, and so we'll, we'll detail that. Um, some of the purposes and the reasons why they are longer are still being explored and trying to be improved upon. Uh, with my time here in the city, um, finding out why those things are happening are, are a main thing and working with the city to reduce those. So the idea of, uh, you know, discussions about vegetation mitigation to redu reduce pond fr um, palm fronds and and different things such as mylar balloons going into circuits, um, but also the improvements that we're doing with cutoff switches and everything else, uh, hopefully will have a significant difference as we go forward from 22 on to reduce that record. Uh, it is a record that I stand uh, I stand next to as an employee, uh, but it's one that as I come in and learn more about Edison, uh, I hope that we can improve that uh, for your city. Uh, and, all, and all the cities in my coverage area, but those are uh, the challenge of the record and the record that I'll be fighting daily to improve upon with the help of the city. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing you on the, uh, you said you're going to be on the 6th, so I guess you'll be in at the planning commission. Yeah, I think uh, Susan is going to bring me in. I believe it's two o'clock and um, make it available for the commission and others who chose to join that day. Hello, Susan. Hi, let's see your face. Yeah, let me just clarify. The meeting on the 6th is for our EOC team leadership and public information for our situational awareness as we start our pre-fire season planning. Uh, typically, we also uh, provide probably the same presentation that he's providing to us on the 6th. We'll do it for the community. In September, we traditionally have Edison present during preparedness month in you know, um, as part of that to get the community up to date on those things. Yeah, Sarah Kaplan has made me aware of that. Uh, Rudy Gonzalez has presented that type of address in the past, but again, um, delivered be, you know, likely before July the 6th, will be the entire report for review by the council and the city manager, and then the address on that day. And on that day, I'll bring in some um, support expert persons in certain areas that can speak to certain areas that the mayor brought up and other questions. So uh, I'll have a contingent yeah. that has a, a wide variety of responses they can deliver. Thank you. And Andrew. just to clarify again, the sixth is for the EOC team, not for the council. Yeah. Otherwise, we would have to notice it as a public public meeting. <laughs> so. Um, but the, but the sixth, the yeah. report will be available to everyone. Okay, it's, of course. Yeah, and, and we will share it with everybody. Yeah. yeah. And if there are additional private addresses that the council would want to do, uh, I'm very available to do that. All right. And thanks for our adjustment of the agenda. That brings us to items number 7C and 7D. And I believe that. Bruce, would you like to open with yours? The staff can I just give a report or no? Uh, either way is fine with me. So there's a staff report to the city, so I think the staff should give the report on the proposals. Very well. Is Elizabeth here? No, um, I'm sorry, Deputy City Manager Shavelson is not here this evening. I, I'd be happy to try to give a quick summary of, of both reports. I, I was not prepared to do that. Typically, when it's an item on the agenda from a council member, we will typically, as staff, defer uh, to the council member or council members who, who have uh, placed that item on the agenda. Well, um, then, I'm, then I'm happy to do so. I, I thought we were going to have a staff report. Uh, so, look, the 7C is really um, simple. Um, and, and I think it dovetails with 7D, and I'm not going to speak to 7D, though, specifically now. I'll speak to that later. But um, we're all aware, uh, anyone in this country that's, that's not in a coma is aware that um, school shootings are happening. I mean, one is too many, but they're happening with ridiculous um, regularity, and uh, we, don't want, we want to make sure it doesn't happen here. So um, the proposal in 7C, I'm not an expert on um, how to best prevent school shootings in Malibu. Um, I don't profess to know that whatsoever. There are multiple experts out there that do. 
And um, I think we owe it to um, the residents. We owe it to ourselves to hire someone who knows what they're doing, to educate us on the options as to um, what is the best scenario for um, increasing the security of our children. And um, then, then after we receive those recommendations, the public gets an opportunity to weigh in, uh, make an intelligent decision as to what would work best and implement it. So uh, it seems, seems to me it's pretty much a no-brainer to hire someone that knows what they're doing to tell us what to do. Uh, that's the proposal. Okay. And I guess what we will do is do a, this, a similar introduction for 7D and then uh, get the input from the public for both of them. That's okay. Karen, would you like to start or shall I? Um, sure, I will, Paul. Um, so uh, right after the school shooting in Texas, I received a call from um, Isaac Burgess, who's the Malibu Pathway Director for SMMUSD, asking for a meeting uh, to talk about ways that we could address it. Uh, so I asked Mayor Grisanti if he would join in that meeting, City Manager McCleary, Assistant City Manager Tony, uh, our uh, Lost Hills Captain uh, for the Sheriff's Department, uh, Captain C2, along with uh, Lieutenant Waters. Uh, Patrick Miller, Principal of Malibu High, uh, was included in the invitation but was unable to be at the meeting and um, uh, school board member Craig Foster was also present. So that first meeting, there were eight of us. And um, uh, I don't know if I need to repeat this entire uh, council uh, agenda item. It's, it's not very long for anybody who hasn't read it yet. It's two pages. Uh, we had a kind of round table discussion and Captain C2's recommendation was that we do not go with a, um, a, a member of the sheriff's department team. I think there were a few issues. Number one, she did not have the personnel to staff an additional position. Uh, and number two, she thought that if we were to consider private security, uh, it would give us more options, uh, more control and would cost less. So after that, we had a second meeting, which was seemed like it was about a week later. Um, 30 people met in that second meeting. Uh, the first one was uh, in person. The second one was virtual. And the attendees there were uh, the people from the first meeting, along with uh, parent leaders, leaders of the Boys and Girls Club, faculty members of Malibu High that were uh, asked by Principal Miller to attend, uh, members of the English language learning community. Uh, I think that's it. So it was really kind of a, a learning session for all of us. And what we came to was not a recommendation for any particular service or uh, response. Uh, it seemed like the best way to approach this is uh, what Mayor Grisanti have, have, and I have asked for in item 7D, which is for the city to put out a request for proposal uh, to private security firms and get their responses on, on how they would approach this. And I think it would include everything from assessment of the campus, perhaps campus hardening, although we have been told more than once that the district has performed that uh, assessment or more than one. Um, and then go from there. And uh, just, I will say, uh, I've gotten responses from parents who were at the meeting and some uh, school community members who were not at the meeting. There is a spectrum of opinion on this as there is on most things, uh, everything from feeling a strong need for enhanced security at the schools to having um, apprehension about additional security and certainly armed security on campus. And, and I respect all opinions 
I'm sure some of those people have signed up to speak tonight. So that's where it is. In my mind, it's, it's an open question. Uh, I want the community to be heard on this and to feel that uh, the city is doing what it can to address what, in my opinion, is a completely unacceptable situation. And sadly, the most vulnerable, our children, are the most exposed, uh, as we've seen in incidents for the last 25 years or more. So I guess that's all I have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I believe at this time we would uh, have Kelsey go through the list of people who are gonna talk, and then uh, we will be able to discuss after that. So Kelsey, who do we have waiting to speak? You have eight speakers for these two items. The first few are Joe Drummond, Stacey Roos, Kelly Pestis, and Steve Freeze. We'll hear from Joe Drummond first. Thank you. Joe, are you available? Hi, yes, good evening, Council. Um, my eldest daughter who graduated Malibu High three years ago had a couple of gun scare incidents at the school. Apparently, a firearm was found in a student's vehicle and another student threatened to shoot people at their graduation. I have no idea what was done with this regards to these incidents, though I do know the student who made the threat was allowed to attend the graduation as a guest. We need some school regulation and proper instruction to leaders and students of Malibu schools. We also need psychiatric evaluation for anyone who has appeared as a threat. And we need a full-time school psychologist. I, don't, I can't believe there isn't one. The real threats are scary and not impossible in our beautiful area, so something constructive needs to be done. So thank you for bringing this up to this council. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker is Stacy Ruth, followed by Kelly Pestis, Steve Breeze, and Maya Zander. Hey, Stacy, are you available? Yes, I am here. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, my name is Stacy Rouse. I'm a member of the community. I live here and I'm also part of um, school leadership. And I want to first just say thank you to Bruce and Paul and Karen um, as our council members and mayors. I know all five of you see this as an important issue, but I really appreciate you bringing it up to the forefront and collaboration I think is going to be key. And I really like already the collaboration of bringing these items together, knowing that it involves schools and local law enforcement and potentially other outside companies and the voices of the parents. Um, and so I um, hope that a request for proposal can be made. Um, and I hope it's robust. I hope it really is able to cover the spectrum of where people are at, what their knowledge is, what they're comfortable with, and that we take good research, which is out there for what really makes a community safe and what doesn't, um, and that we really discuss this together and take appropriate action. And I'm so grateful to you as the city willing to put a request out there and to come along with funding since the school district does not fund that directly. Um, and um, they're funding um, in city of Santa Monica, they're funding it for Santa Monica schools. And uh, we, we don't have the same funding here. So I, I just really appreciate the openness and whatever I can do to help, I would like to help as we go forward. Thank you, Stacy. Our next speaker is Kelly Pestis, followed by Steve Breeze, Maya Zander, and Ethan White. Hi, Kelly, are you available? Yeah, good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, first of all, to you, Mayor Grisanti, to Councilman Silverstein and Councilperson Fair for sponsoring this pilot program to enhance, in, eh, enhance security at our four Malibu schools. I also want to thank Steve Yearing, who this May 5th, 19 days before Uvalde, met with Acting Captain Joey Fender, Principal Patrick Miller and Principal Melise Andino to discuss dire issues concerning school security. Of course, this has been a topic of discussion for years, but Uvalde has served as yet another horrific wake up call. On May 26, Malibu Middle and Malibu High School had a regularly scheduled PTSA meeting. We met in person with two of our four Malibu principals. They spoke passionately about tonight's issue of school safety 
and discussed areas where we can still improve, namely via school resource program. We've come a long way, but we still have specific gaps to fill. At that in-person PTSA meeting, we took a vote to support our city in the examination of SROs or a similar program to enhance campus safety. It was unanimously approved for our middle and high schools, and there were no dissenting votes. Organizations like the Boys and Girls Club, Malibu School Safety Partnership, Safe at Malibu Schools, the Malibu Association of Realtors, Malibu's only school board member, Craig Foster, community organizations and parents support having additional security features at each of our four schools. These are items that we naturally do not want to discuss publicly, but believe that all five council members have been briefed. We are begging you to move forward tonight to make our precious kids, our dedicated staff, safer with this proposed pilot program and the RFP. Thank you again to council members Uring, Brasanti, Silverstein, and Fair for your commitment to sponsorship tonight. I also want to thank council member Mikey Pearson, who, along with Chris Frost, safety manager, Susan Duenas, and most recently, our new city manager, Steve McClary, have all been present at meetings and have expressed support for enhanced safety. And now we're asking you, our council, to vote affirmatively to fund it. We've worked hard over the last four years to get here. It just took another 21 souls and another sad event to shake us to this crucial point tonight. Thank you to all five council members for taking this seriously and acting sooner rather than when it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Our next speaker would be Steve Breeze, but I don't see him in the meeting, so we'll see if we can circle back, and we'll hear from Maya Zander next, followed by Ethan White, Sonia Pearl, and Julie Jones. Hi, Maya. Are you available? Hi. Gotcha. Hi, I'm Maya Zander. I'm a teacher at Malibu Middle and High School, and I'm on the School Safety Committee. I actually thought when we went to that meeting that we were going to be talking about stuff like fences and cameras, so I was totally unprepared for the majority of the discussion being about armed guards, um, but that's the aspect I'm going to talk about tonight. The fact is I feel really conflicted about this, but the more I think about it, the more concerned I am. I called as many teachers as I could get a hold of um, it's summer. Um, feedback was pretty mixed, but a very sizable majority was completely against any armed presence and especially private security, and here are some of their concerns. So they fall into two main questions. The first one is, will armed presence on campus actually make us safer? There have been armed officers at several of our country's worst school shootings, including Uvalde and Parkland. Their presence didn't deter the shooter from coming to campus. They didn't intervene with the shooter once they were on campus, and they didn't save anybody. So how do we know that this will be different at our school? Um, the second question is, are we just trying to make people feel safer if we're not sure this will actually make us safer? Um, and an armed presence will make many people on our campus feel less safe. Those are the exact words I heard over and over when I talked to people. There are very serious concerns, especially about our students of color being made to feel less welcome on campus than they already do. And yes, I did have people of color say those exact words that they would feel less welcome, less safe, and they were worried they would be viewed with more suspicion. Um, there are concerns about accidental discharge of weapons, which apparently happens much more commonly than I realized. Um, and as I said a little bit earlier, there were very, very, very strong negative reactions to the option of private armed security. Even some of the staff who responded enthusiastically to the idea of a school resource officer were completely against private security because we have no guarantee that they have been either selected or trained as carefully as a deputy might be. So to tie it all together, if we can't be sure that an armed presence will actually make us safer, but their presence will definitely make members of our community feel less safe, and there's a measurable, there's a chance of measurable harm to some of our students from marginalized communities, we could accidentally undermine our own goals with this project. So what I would like to convey is that we need to make sure we don't make any reactionary decisions here. We all want our schools to be safe, um, but there can be very harm, harmful consequences when good people with good intentions make decisions that aren't well enough planned. The decision to have an armed presence on campus shouldn't be made without substantial community discussion. That discussion needs to be more inclusive than it has been to this point. It needs to include more people from marginalized communities, more students and parents, and teachers and staff from all the schools, not just mine. So for the record, I'm 100% in favor of making our schools as safe as possible. And we should absolutely look into all of the options, but many of us teachers would like to prioritize the solutions that don't involve guns. 
I have a lot at stake here too, because I work there. So this is not hypothetical. I just want to make sure that we choose solutions that are both safe and effective for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Our next speaker is Ethan White, followed by Sonia Pearl, Julie Jones, and Bill Simpson. Hi, Ethan, are you available? Yes, hi, I'm Ethan White, and I'm, res I'm representing the Boys and Girls Club tonight. I am the Data and Development Director for the Boys and Girls Club. I'm also a parent, um, and I'm also rebuilding a burned down house in Malibu, which I feel like is just part of my identity now, and I'm almost done. Um, but uh, Maya, I want to thank you for what you just brought up because it's it, it it's great to hear the concerns about um, about the armed presence, especially as we're all thinking through this. Um, and I'd just like to convey, the Boys and Girls Club is incredibly proud of our partnership with the city and the schools, and how hard we wait we work to kind of fill gaps and make us all feel safer. We recently completed a three month safety audit through the National Boys and Girls Club of America. Um, it's a very comprehensive audit of all of our practices, our policies, our procedures, but included an audit from the Boys and Girls Club perspective of the campuses because we are on the campuses. Um, and by and large, the they came back saying, you're doing everything great. Every there There isn't a lot more that we could be doing in that respect. We also have a full service wellness center that provides mental health counseling and mental health services free of charge to the full to all the schools and all the school staff anybody who wants it really in the community so we're addressing that part as well um, but what's come up over and over and over and I think this is is what's come up with Uvalde is the lack of is the concern about the response time when we don't have a police force in Malibu so like what Myra's concern about having or Maya's concern about having the armed armed presence on campus, even if we didn't have the armed presence on campus, we just need a faster response time, whether that's, you know, if that's achieved through an SRO or private security that maybe isn't seen, but is there and able to respond quickly. I think this is something that comes up and I've heard Patrick Miller bring it up time and again, is they can't, you know, it's hard to get a hold of somebody and get somebody to come from the Valley over to Malibu and given our geography, it just places us in a very vulnerable position. Um, and I'd just like to also say that I feel very lucky to have um, Gen C2 back as the captain at Lost Hills. And I think, you know, if we just follow her advice, we'll be doing the best we can. Um, so I'm speaking in support of the RFP um, and want to thank thank for all the council members for for caring about this and making this a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Our next speaker is Sonia Pearl, followed by Julie Jones and Bill Sampson. Sonia, are you there? Are you available? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm the outgoing PTSA president at Malibu Middle and Malibu High, and a concern that the student representative repeatedly brings up at our Malibu High School Site Council is that students feel unsafe at school. And although Principal Miller has ensured that we have security and limited access of the lay public to our campus, the recent violence sweeping the schools in our nation requires exploring further security options as a community to make smart decisions. And uh, we know that response time is important in crisis situations and the way our schools are located around the city, this is even more imperative. Uh, I get Dr. Zander and other teachers concerns about armed presence, but we do need to find out what's out there. So we know what our options are and the RFP for a school security service pilot program for our four schools will do that. It's an invaluable resource available to our schools that help our students feel safer and may provide a more secure, uh, you know, environment for our uh, children. Our city has always been proactive and we don't ever want a time of what ifs where our kids are concerned. So thank you for your willingness to explore options. Thank you, Sonia. Our next speaker is Julie Jones, followed by Bill Sampson. Hi, Julie, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hi, um, good evening. I'm speaking tonight as both a concerned parent and a teacher of 23 years at Malibu Middle School, because uh, I understand that we're considering proposals anyway, that might include hiring armed guards for our school campus. I want to be clear that as a parent and a teacher, I want nothing more than to ensure everyone's safety. 
with that in mind, there has to be a middle ground between added security and armed security. Malibu Middle and High School is a unique, small enough community that we know everyone and we built relationships with our students. Our current security team is fantastic and they know our students by name. They recognize their cars and know their parents. This is what keeps our campus safe. Introducing an outside agency with rotating personnel will not ensure our safety. Once we take that road, we cannot go back. I do not want to become a campus which has prioritized the illusion of security over actual preventative systems. And I understand the need for people to feel as though they're doing something to protect our community, but I see no verifiable evidence to prove that armed guards will do so. In fact, data strongly suggests that not only do armed guards do nothing to prevent the most serious school violence incidents, but rather they very often end up introducing new unintended risks for campuses. There are certainly measures we can take to improve campus safety. Of course, we have many entry points and it's a very difficult perimeter to secure. Perhaps more personnel could be stationed so that someone's always watching uh, the upper fields, someone's always watching near the pool gate, et cetera. And those security guards, they don't need to be armed. Um, we should explore this option thoroughly before considering, you know, weaponizing any of our security. Perhaps we could have sheriffs or the school resource officers I've heard people already talk about on campus so that kids get to know them. And more importantly, they get to know our kids. Perhaps the council could invest in programming like the Sandy Hook Promise or some other programs that support students' mental health and help to proactively reach any community members who might potentially be at risk. My own two children attend our school. So again, I stress safety is paramount. I just believe prevention should be the goal of any action moving forward. Safety is best achieved by bolstering the relationships between teachers, administrators, staff, and students. I don't need my own children on a heightened level of concern because of the constant presence of armed guards. I implore the council to prioritize any proposals that don't involve weaponizing our campus or our security, um, because I, I just don't believe that more guns, I don't, they're not the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Our next speaker is Bill Sampson, followed by Ryan Embry. You have the floor, Mr. Sampson. Uh, first, uh, thank you all five of you for considering this intractable, apparently national problem. Uh, I don't pretend to have answers. Uh, I listened to uh, the teacher, I, I, who I don't know, Dr. Zander, someone called her Dr. Zander and Mr. White and Ms. Jones. I would tend to agree that turning a campus in, in, into an armed camp is a bad idea and a bad way to handle this problem. I do recall Mr. Green, who apparently knew everybody because, and my daughter proudly informed she was ditching school and she wanted to get a zero for the day when she went down to protest the um, Bush the Second's invasion of Iraq. Um, he seemed to know everybody and know everything. Uh, he was hard to replace. I don't know the current ones, I'm sure they're good. I'm terribly concerned about the prospect of private security guards. In a private life, uh, I regret to say some of my income came from representing um, on behalf of their insurance companies, some of those people. And I found them generally to be much less qualified than law enforcement people. Maybe it's time, and I don't have the facts to do it, to think again about our own police force. I don't know if that can work. I really don't. Uh, I suspect most of you have an inkling or maybe they, maybe you don't know either, um, but it would certainly be worth considering. And then you could say, okay, we want police, a policeman nearby. Even that scares me a little bit because it certainly changes the dynamic of education. I'm well aware that people walking into schools and shooting them up changes education also. Um, I never forgot having to get underneath my desk to protect myself from nuclear attack. Um, and now we're doing the same thing and it doesn't work. Before spending money on private security, I would urge you to, if you're going to select armed guards, that they be professional law enforcement officers. I would prefer them actually to be from our own police force, 
uh, rather than the sheriff because the sheriff's just too far away. Um, but having guns in a school, I don't think it's likely to work. If you can figure it out, that's great. I know no one in this room or this meeting is in favor of schools being shot up. We're just trying to figure out how to stop it. I know how to reduce it, but the Supreme Court of the United States disagrees with me. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Ryan Embry, and then we'll circle back to Steve Breeze. Hi, Ryan, are you available? Yes, thank you. I wanted to say I sent an email to Dr. Ben Drotti and the city, the um, school district's uh, risk manager and received no response in the last week. So I forwarded the letter to the council. I hope you've all read that. I wanted to reiterate when the school was uh, exploring various configurations for build, rebuilding various buildings with our bond money in the mid 2000s that the Malibu Lost Hills Sheriff's Traffic Sergeant Kevin Mock took the sheriff's helicopter over the school to assess the issues of the traffic problems that the school was creating along Morning View Drive to come up with some type of a solution. And one of those solutions was to have dedicated circular traffic pattern on the campus for the purposes of pickup drop off of students on the school district property to get the, the opening doors out of the narrow um, city street morning view drive. And also that would provide for emergency ingress and evacuation um, of the school. Uh, we were mainly thinking about fire, but that happens uh, to come up now at this point. So this ring road or horseshoe road around the campus is something that can be integrated even after the fact to somehow achieve the ability of the sheriffs to respond and pull up next to um, you know, a building for when time is of the essence. And I wanted to say, I don't know what happened to that uh, professional opinion from our own sheriff, uh, how that didn't get um, better consideration. But I, I find it uh, very difficult to um, understand that every local city, county uh, jurisdiction is expected to now fund on campus security in public schools. That's an unfunded economic burden and mandate. Um, I understand that everybody says, hey, let's just get the city to pay for it for now and maybe forever. But the eligibility of schools and school districts, and by the way, their budget is 10 times that of the city of Malibu for the Santa Monica School District. And they'll be eligible for grant funding from the federal level for this. And if we start doing it, as a city, I'm not so sure that will work. Usually grants are given for programs that are not existing. And I'm also very concerned about putting armed uh, private security on school campuses and be reminded that the one of the officers in El Monte was shot with his own weapon that was taken away from the officer by the suspect. So Ryan, that's that's your time. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Steve Breeze. Hi, Steve. Are you available? Uh, hi, I'm I'm Hudson Breeze, his son, and my dad's in a meeting right now for the uh, for the fire department, so I'm taking his place. Okay. Um, so I'm an eight, a ninth grader at Malibu Middle School, and I'm writing to tell you my concern for safety at our school. Oftentimes, I find that during lunch, I'm looking at the unsecured gates and thinking to myself, what would happen if an armed shooter just walked through the, uh, them right now? Just as we saw this this week, well, when I wrote this was a while ago, when 19 kids were killed. The answer is nothing. We are powerless against a shooter. Without an armed and trained professional here to protect our community's future, we may, may find ourselves falling prey to a deranged person wishing to die in infamy. Unless we wish to make a name for ourselves as a school in the list of mass shootings, we must take precautions to ensure our lives, uh, the lives of our kids and staff at our school, as well as to dissuade any attempts. 
we must bring a school resource officer onto campus, not only for protection, for peace, but for peace of mind, as well as training uh, uh, for us as, uh, for such a horrible circumstance. I feel lucky to live in such a wonderful place, but I don't always feel safe. Please vote for a campus sheriff for our school, so I and many other who shares my feel uh, can feel safe at school. And also, um, uh, one third of adverted attacks uh, uh, are prevented by an SRO, uh, re either reporting the plot or when they were found, they, it was one of the major reasons that they didn't um, attack was because of, they saw an armed officer on campus. And um, another issue is that if if a shooter comes to the school, the nearest sheriff uh, sheriff's um, station is is um, is too far away. And by the time they would get here, already tens would be killed. And and so without without a resource officer, if a person came onto our school campus right now and started shooting, the only thing that we could do was ask them kindly to stop. So, thank you. Thank you, Hudson. And Mayor, I don't have any other speaker sign-ups or raised hands from the public, so that concludes public comment. Okay, that brings us to the council. And I saw a hand for a second, I thought. Actually, I've, I've got, uh, I've got a hand from Karen L. Harden, who uh, wrote to us. I'd be happy to set a timer for her and you can hear her public comments. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I did write, but I, I, I also wanted to um, just share some words as well. But thank you, Mayor Gasanti and, and council members. Um, I'm a parent of an incoming sixth grader at Malibu Middle. And I will be the incoming PTA president at Malibu Middle and, and High School in the upcoming school year. And Sonia has informed me that this is going to be a hot topic among parents and students. And as a parent, I'd like to support my support for this item. And like Maya, Xander, I was initially conflicted about the idea of armed presence on campus. But after the discussion with Captain C2, and hearing from a security firm, firm, I was much more comfortable with the idea. And I think that getting more information in order to make an informed decision is the right move to make. And to Maya's point, distribution of that information, um, along with a conversation, should absolutely be expanded to more parents, teachers, and, and minority groups. But for this, it's about requesting information to enable an informed decision by this council around how to protect some of our youngest citizens. Uh, the teachers, the schools, the parent groups, the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu are doing what we can to support prevention of an incident, but we need the city's help with action should an incident occur. And to Ethan's point, action is about enabling a, a rapid response time. And Captain C2 recommended that we explore the private security option as the most efficient way to ensure minimal response time at all of our schools should action be required. And in my opinion, hers is the one that carries the most experience and knowledge and, and one we should listen to. So it's simply a, an approval to request proposals for a pilot program. And once you have the information around the costs and the implementation, we can collectively make an informed decision on how to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And Mayor, at this point, I'm not seeing any other raised hands from the public. So that okay. concludes public comment again. Or, or I'm sorry, if there is one more or two more raised hands. Um, if you're ready, we can hear from Lonnie Gordon next. Sure. Well, Lonnie, are you available? Are, are we speaking on another subject now or is it just schools? 7C and 7D is what we're speaking Okay, of. I'm sorry, then I then I will lower my hand. Thank you. And the other speaker also lowered their hand for this item, so that concludes public comment. Okay, that brings us back to the council, and Karen's hand has been waiting patiently. Thanks, Paul. Um, I just think it's appropriate at this time uh, for Captain C2 
to address all of us, um, and perhaps uh, for the benefit of everybody listening, uh, give a recap of what she has told us to date. Um, and she and I have spoken about it uh, before those meetings and uh, in the interim. Uh, I I would like to hear from her because what I'm seeing right now, and and I am concerned about this, and I don't I don't want anybody to think I'm not hearing it. Uh, and I will also say not not a hugely representative sample, but it may be the trend uh, that this is something that parents to so far are expressing uh, support for, uh, but the support is not coming from teachers. Uh, and I realize many of our teachers are also parents in our district. So we need to take all of this into account. Um, but if Captain C2 uh, could address us, I would appreciate that very much. Is Captain C2 in the, uh, in the uh, web on the Zoom? Yes, I am. Um, is there any way that someone can turn on the video? Um, it says I'm not allowed to to turn on my video, or It'll I can just take do a that. moment. Okay. It'll just take a moment to change the setting. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is this is a topic that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, in 2019. I met with Pat Miller, um, the, the principal of Malibu High School, who's a great, great partner, and we discussed this very thing. So I just want to kind of give you a little bit of, of background, of my background, so you kind of uh, maybe understand a little bit more where I'm coming from. So um, from 2015 to 2017, I was the intelligence lieutenant for the department and was attached to a joint terrorism task force with the FBI. In 2017, I served as the deputy director of the Joint Regional Intelligence Center, where my main focus was school threats. Um, and I just want to share a story with you just real quick. Um, while I was the deputy director of the JREC, Joint Regional Intelligence Center, I received a call from a woman. And she called and said, is this you know, just Jennifer C2? And I said, yes, how can I help you? And she immediately started crying. And she told me that she heard about some of the stuff that I'm doing with um, school threats. And she said that she lost her daughter at Sandy Hook. And so from there, that has really, really touched my heart because she was crying in such a way that as a mom, I never like could understand the depth of her pain. And then just um, when I came here to Malibu as the Malibu liaison lieutenant, and um, I think it was in 2019, I met with a dear, dear friend, a Malibu resident named uh, Kathy Eldon, and she introduced me to, um, to a woman whose son was this shooter in the Isla Vista school shooting. And um, actually hearing from two different parents on the side, on both sides of it, you know, it just really kind of gave me a passion for this. And really, um, you know, I know I've gotten many, many calls ever since this has kind of happened that, um, you know, advocating armed security guards, really prevention is the most important. That's what I'm advocating. I am advocating prevention. You know, I don't want to respond to this. I want to prevent this. And really Malibu has a leg up because they have the, the Boys and Girls Club. And really what, what Casey is doing at the Boys and Girls Club with the counseling and actually making isolated kids feel part of a community that's really some of the some of the answers to the to these um, to this problem. And Pat Miller, we met in 2019 and talked about security. And I brought in a threat assessment from the JRIC, who actually that's all he does is threat assessments. And he actually did a security assessment of the actual structure and provided um, uh, Pat Miller with a report. So I feel like we're on the right track. And I know Pat Miller has done a lot of um, changes since 2019. Um, so I wanted to start off with that. And if you guys are very interested in this, I know I heard like a lot of stats throwing out, thrown out today and um, SROs don't make a difference. You know, I would recommend that you go on to the United States Secret Service website. They are the leaders and they actually put um, reports out. I think it's every year. The, uh, the most recent one, recent one was in two, uh, 20, uh, 2021. And it's called adverting targeted school violence. 
And they came up with 10, with 10 different um, points, the main points of how we as parents, as law enforcement, as a school district can actually prevent school violence. And so I recommend, and I can, um, maybe I can send it to council and we can put that out, out to um, the community. But SROs were actually part of it. They put in there and I'm reading it verbatim. It says school resource officers play an important role in school violence prevention. In nearly one third of the, this was inverted cases, an SRO played a role in either reporting the plot or responding to the report by, that was made by someone. So SROs are important. And um, I know many people have heard me say that, um, you know, about deputies and we're short staffed. That, that is correct. So if it's a, if it's a, you know, if the council does one or the community wants one deputy, that's fine. But I'm thinking like more of a, like a, a model deputies are very, very expensive. The cost of a deputy is you could get basically four or five security guards for the cost of a deputy. And um, so that's why I came up with the, the security, um, the, the security model in Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills School District. Um, has a model the community wanted armed security guards and that's what Beverly Hills is doing I spoke with the superintendent and the chief of police and both of them say this model works perfect for us it's been a great model then um, I spoke to the head security for the Palisades and what the community over there decided is they didn't want armed security they wanted unarmed security in their schools but they wanted a roving patrol that was armed security and so these are different options and I, I'm looking through, you know, item D and I don't see anything that says armed security in that. This is really just a, re, a you know, request for, for a proposal of just, is this something that we're interested in hearing from a security company? What are some of the options that we have um, from, from even hardening a school to, to, to security guards? So um, I think it would be wise for us to at least look at a proposal and see if that um, makes sense to the community because this, I have two kids that are in elementary school. I'm at Las Virginas School District. So I understand, um, you know, if someone asked me, do you want uh, metal detectors in your schools? You know, as a, as a police officer, I'm like, oh, every tool is great. But as a mom, I don't want metal detectors. I don't want my kids going through metal detectors. So I, parents, I understand where you're coming from and I'm right there with you. So I would love to partner with everybody and come up with a solution that works for Malibu. And I'm available if you guys have any questions for me. Thank you, Captain C2. Okay. Mikey, I see your hand raised. Would you like to speak next? Yeah, sure. I'm speaking after uh, Captain C2 is uh, an honor and a privilege. I mean, basically, there's not a thing I could say that she didn't just say with professional expertise on top of it. Um, I want—I first want to thank all the speakers. I really appreciate people showing up and speaking on this issue. This has been the elephant in the room in Malibu since I attended school here. Um, I'm really thinking this is the moment we, we take another step. I think that's pretty obvious. I don't think anyone's opposed to actually doing something here. Um, I'm grateful to... Captain C2 for her, not only her passion, but her expertise, having her here at this time feels like a blessing. And um, I couldn't agree more that the main thing I wanted to talk about is I think there's a lot we can do on prevention. I don't know if we eventually need armed help or not. I have no clue on that. Uh, but when I walk around the schools and I look at the schools, it seems like that's where we start. It's like preventing a fire from burning your house down. Make your house so it's fireproof. It's the same thing with the school. Make it make it less easy or likely for somebody that shouldn't be there to be there. So, um, but with that, I'm all in favor of putting out the RFP, and um, and I'll keep my comments short. So, thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Mikey. Karen, I see your hand again. Yeah, I just have a question about the Sandy Hook promise um, and Captain C2. I don't know if you know the answer to this. Um, is it typically school districts who sign up for that or is it parent organizations like PTSA or is it other uh, youth 
related organizations like the Boys and Girls Club? Could it be all of them? I, I'm not really sure of how to go about implementing that program. Thank you, um, Council Member, for, for bringing that up. Yeah, Sandy, Sandy Hook promises, um, many of you heard me talk about it. It's really near and dear to my heart because when you talk about prevention, you know, this is a, really a free program. And the what Sandy Hook offers is, you know, start with hello, where it talks about a campaign so kids don't feel isolated. Um, they have an app that's worth millions and millions of dollars where actually some states um, uh, put it into law where um, our public schools K through 12 must implement the Sandy Hook promise because this is a way for kids to actually, if a friend is saying something that they talking about an attack, you know, the stats here with the Secret Service says, I think it's about like 70 or 80 percent of kids will actually communicate that they're going to uh, uh, make a plot. And so with that, you know, giving kids an access to actually communicate because they're not going to come and, you know, raise their hand at law enforcement or go to mommy, daddy. But this is a way for the kids to actually communicate. And it goes directly to crisis and their um, crisis um, centers where they work directly with the school district. So Sandy Hook, before it used to be law enforcement and school districts had to come together to implement the Sandy Hook promise. Um, it is no longer like that. I just spoke to the Sandy Hook. Um, promise, and they said that they can actually implement it um, without without law enforcement. But here in Malibu, because I'm such a big supporter of Sandy Hook Promise, I am happy to partner with the school district. And really, law enforcement stays out of it until until it needs to come to us. And really, it's at the the fingertips of the school district. So this is not about law enforcement spying. I won't see law enforcement won't see any of that information unless is it rise to an immediate threat. Um, so that's why I really like, there's so many other things about the Sandy Hook promise, but um, those are a couple of things that I just wanted to touch on. And um, they're, I already spoke to them. They are ready to have any conversations with the school district. So um, we are open. Bruce? Yeah. Thanks, Paul. First of all, it's great to see um, Captain C2, um, to hear from you and, and to see you on video. And as I've said before, I wish we would allow our residents to be seen on video too, because it provides a different level of communication that's missing. And I, I applaud the captain for asking to be put on video because it, it makes this conversation a lot easier. I wish we would do that with the rest of the people as well. Um, I'm actually surprised that we're not talking about the proposal I made, not because it's my proposal, but because I think it's in line with what I've been hearing from a lot of the comments. And I think it's consistent with uh, and not in contravention to the, the other proposal. Um, I'm gonna start off by saying, you know, the, the Brown Act precludes more than two of us from getting together outside of a meeting and talking about these kinds of things. So this is, this is gonna be our conversation now. Uh, but I, I was very surprised two weeks ago when I asked if, if others of us were able to join this community conversation and was told, no, it's a private meeting. Um, only Karen and Paul could be there and nothing against Karen and Paul for that. But, you know, we as a council are supposed to figure out what we want to prioritize, how we want to prioritize it and select who we want to be involved in that conversation to best represent our views collectively. And that didn't happen here. Um, so, you know, three of us don't know what happened at that meeting. We're hearing, we're hearing the summary of it. And we're hearing mixed reactions from residents and from and from teachers. Um, you know, I, I have tremendous respect for and admiration for the, the sheriff's department. They they keep us as safe as they can. Um, prior to Captain Sito, had a good relationship with um, Captain Becerra. Um, but you know, the, the the solution of armed guards, which is private law enforcement, is it's it's the sheriff's department being here. I mean, I says, when, there's a saying, when you're a hammer, every problem is a nail. And it's not, it's unsurprising to me that the sheriff's department's initial reaction and, and recommendation would be private law enforcement. We can't do it, but law enforcement's the right answer because sheriff's department is law enforcement. That's what they know. Um, I'm concerned that if all we do is put out an RFP for private security companies, we're gonna have the reverberation of multiple hammers. We're not going to have the considered views 
of people who look at other angles. And that's why I started off by saying, I'm not an expert on school security. I'm sure that um, law enforcement and armed guards is one of many things that ought to be considered, but I don't know that it's the answer. I don't know that it's more important than other things. I don't know that it's less important than other things. I don't know whether it's counterproductive, as was said by a number of the speakers. Um, one speaker, I, I think it was um, Dr. Zander, talked about um, not having a reactionary response that's, that's good intentions. You know, there's a saying also that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, uh, which is why I always favor getting answers from experts. And I think the Sheriff's Department is one of the multiple experts we need to hear from, but we're not hearing from any others. So I, I don't want to discourage us from getting, the, getting proposals from security, private security, because we may end up going with that. And it's a good idea, therefore, to start exploring that. But I think it would be a mistake not to explore what other things would make sense. And I don't want to say, you know, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department's an important voice in this discussion. But again, they're, they're one of many voices. And I think we have to have multiple voices before we can make a considered informed decision. And we need to make it quickly. Um, I proposed a month ago that we put on the agenda getting an expert to help us make this decision. And here we are a month later debating it. Um, now, Pepperdine is, is not immune from this problem. Private schools are not immune from this problem, Our Lady of Malibu. I would think that we want to bring all of the schools in Malibu into the conversation and have them all collectively benefit from what the advice is. They may have already got, in fact, Pepperdine may have already gotten information from um, experienced consultants. I don't know. I would, I would expect they did. Um, so whatever we do, and I, and I think we should we should go down both routes at the same time. Like I said, we should get a consultant in here who gives us all kinds of angles. We should put out a request for proposal for security. We should demand that the um, school district fund this. We should demand it, not just ask them and take their, their answer no. Demand it, and if, and if necessary, consider legal action to require it because it is their responsibility to keep our, our school students safe. Um, my guess, and it's, it's just a guess, is that a combination of hardening access combined with dedicated experienced school resource officer, familiarity with the students and their mental health assessment and assistance and mental health assistance, all of that together is likely to be helpful, not just one thing over another, but a combined approach. And I, I just don't want to get myopically focused on going out and hired, hiring armed security when there are other things that may be superior or which work hand in hand that we're letting, that we're missing. Um, I suspect the FBI has done um, substantial um, profiling on the types of people who are likely to shoot up a school. I, I don't, again, I, I only know what I hear on the press and read in the paper, which is just the tip of the iceberg, but I, I'm sure that there are people that know um, who to be on the lookout for and I would think having somebody at the schools that has that kind of information and experience and knowledge would be a helpful thing. I don't think that's private security. I could be wrong. Maybe that is included in private security. Uh, lastly, I'll say that you know a proper construction of the Second Amendment would be great, which recognizes that um, the law is not what the five zealots in Washington have most recently told us it is, but we're stuck with that. So every human in this country is entitled to walk around with a gun apparently now, according to our most recent Supreme Court decision. And uh, we we need to be ever vigilant to prevent another to prevent another school shooting and certainly a school shooting in Malibu. And you know we've heard also a lot of discussion today about Malibu High seems to be said repeatedly. Uh, we have other schools, and you know Webster is is less hardened. It's easier to you know easier to get there. It's just out in the open. I haven't heard any discussion of that. But again, um, I applaud everyone who talked. And but I think what I was hearing from a number of people is. This should be a robust community conversation and, and hearing from 10 people is not robust. We need to do something sooner than later. So I'm not suggesting we continue, we kick this can down the road, but I think we need to set up something promptly to get robust um, input. We need an expert who can tell us um, what to do with that input. And I'll, I'll support doing a um, RFP for security so long as it's not the only thing we're considering. Thanks.
Thank you, Bruce. Steve? Yeah, I, and I, I appreciate all the comments you heard from everybody. You know, this is this is a an issue that's, that a lot of people are struggling with, and we're seeing why tonight. Uh, one of the things I found interesting in the presentations was the thing Captain C2 talked about, where Beverly Hills is doing it one way, Palisades is doing it another way. You've got the uh, Sandy Hook group. I mean, so there are, there are obviously different alternatives in terms of how we get there. And my question, I, I guess, how do we how do we get somebody? Do we more? How do we get information that we can go to the public and say, you know, here's here are the different ways you can go about solving this thing? Because I think that's what we're going to have to give them to get some a consensus going. Because if we just get people together. I mean, there's a lot of emotion in this thing, and some people like guns, other people don't like guns. But you'd love to have somebody standing up there in front of the group saying, you know, we've taken a look at this thing. Here's Here are the different options you have. Here are the pluses and minuses of those options. And I think it'll help us bring the community together and help us come up with an answer that really will provide a solution. So I just don't know how to go about and do that. Who, how, how, do we, how do you find somebody or some group that can give you that kind of, of input? I, I, I don't know if I... I had the answer, I'd give it to you. Call back to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'd like to take a minute. Uh, basically, Sandy Hook Promise is a free program, and that is definitely the low-hanging fruit that we can do, and we're very fortunate that we have uh, the Boys and Girls Club, and I'm going to call on Ethan White in a moment to talk about that, but they, I think they're already utilizing that, but it should be in all of our schools. And basically what it's about is, is telling people to be more mindful of each other and to include people who, who feel like they've been excluded because that is, those are the people who eventually uh, act out. Uh, as far as uh, you know, the information that's out there, uh, there's a lot of information out there, and and I think, like Mikey said, it's it's kind of like home hardening, and that's that's one of the other first steps. It's very easy. We reduce the number of accesses to the campus, and uh, and I went to Webster School the other day, and I got there a little late, and it was all locked up good. And to get in, anybody you had to ring the bell and wait for somebody to come and let you in. So there, that is is going on in our local schools, and they're doing a very good job of doing it unobtrusively. But it is uh, having another layer of of uh, support would be great. And Ethan has his hand raised, and I'm thinking maybe he'll want to talk about uh, the mental health pop, uh, partnership and and the wellness professionals, and maybe even Sandy Hook. Ethan, are you available? Yes. I am. Yes, I, I would be happy to. Also, I just wanted to respond to Bruce as a grant writer, because um, that's what I do day in and day out. Um, we can, I think we can craft the RFP in a way to solicit um, a varied response from private security or other professional consultants. And I understand that wanting to reach out and find those other consultants that have might have a broader range of what they bring rather than just thinking of it as an armed response. Um, so I would, I don't know what that field is like the marriage between mental health and all the prevention type services, but I would think if we craft the RFP carefully, we can get the cut, we can generate the kinds of responses that help us think through it better. Um, and to Paul's point about what we are doing from a mental health standpoint is, and people have brought it up, you know, it's these, it's youth in isolation or feeling isolated. We are measuring social connectedness amongst everybody we serve, and that is being put into a federal database related to a federal grant that we received in response to the Woolsey fire. So um, we're, and it would be in line with what the Sandy Hook app is. Um, that it's taken us two years to kind of put that infrastructure together and have that data, but we are starting to get it back and it's all functional now. Um, so we, it would be easy for us to move that direction. So like if we were having mental health referrals, if that's a part of the approach, they would likely be referred to the wellness center and then they would be getting that assessment, which would be, I think, similar to what the Sandy Hook thing is. 
So that's all I wanted to say. And, and just the part about, I think you could, we can do a lot in the crafting of the RFP to solicit those responses. Thank you, Ethan. Bruce? Thanks. Just, just one last point that I forgot to make before, which is that, and I'm very sensitive to the comments by at least two residents of the, or I think they're both teachers, about the um, students of color being perhaps intimidated um, by armed security on campuses. And I think that's something that we can't overlook. We, it needs to be thought about as well. Okay. Thank you. Well, it sounds like we should craft a motion here. Um, and uh, I agree, we were looking, we're looking for expert help. I don't think we, we have any boundaries on what that looks like exactly. Um, this is, this is, uh, this is an important and big issue and we can't pretend to have all the answers. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I want to be the one that crafts it, but I think it should be open to all experts and that could come help us to some degree. We do need input. We do need education. Um, It'd be great to have Captain C2 help us sort of sort through this too. And um, and obviously the schools and a number of, you know, a number of stakeholders in this area. And, and with that, I'll, I'll let someone else attempt to craft this motion. Mr. Yurin, followed by Karen Farrow. Who is going to craft the RFP? I mean, the, the, the gentleman from the... Uh, the Boys and Girls Club seems to have some experience doing that stuff. I mean, who is going to put, because I would, I, I'd like to make it as broad as we can to get as much input back. I'm just wondering who's going to do that for us. Well, Council Member Uring, that would be primarily done by staff, but uh, we would be happy to work with uh, any particular individuals or members of the community uh, in working on developing that draft. Um, and I think if we were to do that, we would probably want to bring that back to Council. Uh, but we uh, or depending on what direction council would like to give us. But but, yeah, the staff would be the ringleaders on putting that together. Um, but we're happy to work with whomever you would like us to work with. OK. Karen, followed by Bruce. Um, yeah, that is something I wanted to address. Um, it looks like I, I, I think the way I'd like to see this happen uh, is that staff, city staff would work with uh, a representative of the Boys and Girls Club, such as Ethan, Captain C2, uh, district administration, for example, Principal Patrick Miller, or maybe all of the principals. I, I really think the city is going to have to uh, have some kind of a bigger tent um, input process even to craft the RFP, the parent groups, um, the teachers, I don't know if that means uh, the teacher's union rep from each school or uh, the school site council uh, chair from each school, but I really think, and I know Steve, this is probably sounding complicated, but I, I this is a very different item from anything I've seen on the council. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's just becoming a necessity, I think, to address it. Um, so I, I would like to see some kind of a collaborative process, even in the drafting of the RFP. And I'm not sure what it takes to make that happen. But that is my input. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? So um, I know the staff is substantially <laughs> overworked. I hear that all the time. But you know, I, I do think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And in this case, I think we need to run and chew gum at the same time. Um, there, I think there's three things that need to be done here. And uh, I'll try to make this a motion, but I welcome having it condensed. Um, I, I think we need to do two things. We need, we need to put out an RFP for a security um, service, because if it turns out we want a security service or that we find out that's the, that's the best solution we determine, we need to be in, in a position to hire one. So I, I think I like the idea of putting out an RFP so that we can 
have the options, the best options available if we choose to pull that tr trigger. That, no pun intended, that was bad words, but you know what I mean. Um, I think at the same time, though, we, we do need to have a consultant that has a broader um, knowledge base and understanding of what works because they may tell us, yes, private security. They may tell us absolutely not, There's here's the problems with it. And they may also tell us that in addition to private security, you need X, Y, and Z. And if we just if we put out an RFP that does that tries to capture all of that and doesn't focus on getting the best private security, we won't get that broad advice. And if we just ask for the broad advice, we won't be in a position to hire the private security if it turns out that's the recommendation. So I think we need to put them both out. And the part about running, I mean, we need to have something in place. It may, it's not going to be the permanent answer, but we need to have something in place when school opens in the fall. So um, we need to be, do both of these with alacrity. So my, my motion is um, we put out an RFP for private security, we put out an RFP for a um, consultant, and we make a commitment to get a decision on a consultant within 30 days, and we be in a position to hire security if that's the decision that we make by the end of, um, when does school start? August 15th, I think. Is that about 11 right? weeks. Hey, we're running out of time. I, I was yeah. going to say the end of July, but that's 30 days from now, too. We, we, you know, we, we, we can't just spend our time spinning our wheels. Something needs to be done. So, but the proposal is both RFPs for, for private security, for consultant, and with an aim towards having something in place that is better than where we are now when school opens. Council Member Silverstein, is the, do you want those, those, uh, the, the crafted RFPs to come back to the council before they're put out, or I don't think we have time to move out right away on these. I, I I would favor in this case trusting the staff because I don't think we have time for a meeting two weeks from now, and uh, maybe another meeting two weeks from then to discuss this. I see Mikey's hand is raised. Yeah, I just want to suggest we form an ad hoc here on this so we can move a lot quicker. I think it's that's obviously needed. We need to take a couple of us and just that have the time and the drive to accelerate this. And that, that that's would be my input here. Is that a, a friendly amendment? It's a friendly amendment if it'll be accepted. Sure. Okay. Was so that a second to... as well? You amended the motion. Would you like to second it? Sure, I'll second it. Okay. Um, but not sure if it's fully crafted. Uh, maybe it is. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with time is of the essence and uh, we need to move on this, but yet do it, <laughs> do it well. Are, are you proposing members to be on the ad hoc committee tonight or do you want that brought back? Uh, I would see if there's a couple, of, I'm not a good candidate to be one because um, of my schedule right now, but I think there's probably a couple of good volunteers here. Let, let, let's, let's do it now. Karen and Paul, you, you picked up the ball and began running with it without us saying, without us agreeing on it. So do you want to keep running with it? I'm, I'm perfectly happy to. Karen, how do you feel about that? I can as well. Um, I, I would suggest actually uh, that Bruce, you and Paul form the ad hoc. Okay. I, I do want to say I'm not comfortable with sending out an RFP uh, that the council hasn't uh, had a chance to review as a whole. Well, can we, we schedule could do a closed session? session on that? A quick closed session that would be one way of handling that. I don't think it could be. I don't think it can be closed, but we can um, certainly set a very oh, short deadline and, and set a special meeting. But the, you, you will have it come back. I mean, uh, the RFP won't be accepted until the, the council makes a decision on it. So you will see it um, before anyone's hired. So do you mean? Uh, but but we would have the option of having a special meeting to do that if we wanted to save time. Yes. Sure. You, yeah, you can have a special meeting if you if you want to, but I don't know if it's if it's necessary or not. You know, if Karen if Karen is uncomfortable giving a blank check for an RFP, we should just put a deadline on when it will be drafted, like you know, three days from now, and schedule a special meeting for a day or two later. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Steve McClary, I would look to you for uh, a response on turnaround time. Um, I mean, yeah, we can, we can make it a priority as soon as possible. I don't know that we can turn it around and get it back for the July 11th off the top of my head, but if not, we could certainly 
get it back as soon as possible and get a special meeting scheduled just to make it clear here. So what, is, what we're talking about is bringing the draft RFP back for council to take a look at them and approve before issuing it. Yeah, that but, correct? but hopefully before July 11th. Yes, yeah, Steve. I mean, I know, I know you guys are overwhelmed, but if we're going to, if this is going to have meaning, it, it can't wait till July 11th to make the next decision. You, you can have the, if you're, if you're going to create the ad hoc committee, you know, they could review if you trust the ad hoc committee, you know, they can review the RFP um, before it goes out. I, I think that's a great idea. I, I think we all have the same goal. I don't think we're, there's not divergent opinions here on doing something. So I, I think the, I think the ad hoc committee could totally make that decision. That would certainly speed up the process. Okay. And can I clarify? I'm sorry, Steve Urine. I'm sorry. Just a, a quick question. Captain Seeker, you know, the, the second part of this where we're trying to get an expert to come in, do you have any suggestions of, of I mean, you know, we know the FBI. Or, I mean, is there somebody you could direct us to that maybe we could get that process started faster? When you're coming, when it when it's a basically, if you're looking at a whole community approach, like the whole approach, kind of like what um, Council Member Silverstein was talking about, is that what you're referring to? Or are you specifically talking security? Well, I mean, we've got to, we're, we're looking at we're going to do the RFP for the security group. I mean, the, the real question was, is that the best approach for getting a, so we're looking, I think, and maybe I'm, I'm not, I don't want to speak for Bruce, but I think we're looking for somebody to come in and sort of take a look at our, what our situation looks like and give us an alternative of what might be the most effective way to accomplish what we're trying to do. I, I'm just thinking, as opposed to putting on an RFP and waiting for a response, if you know somebody we can go to directly, it may get us there quicker. Yes, I, I uh, know quite a few people from either the JRIC or from um, private security that actually um, have a background in this. Yes. Okay, well, maybe our ad hoc, ad hoc committee should talk to her and see what we can maybe get that moving faster. T Trevor, what is our legal flexibility in terms of how we go about hiring either a consultant or security firm? Do we have to do an RFP? Or can we do one or the other just by doing some quick interviews? I mean, how does that work? It depends on, you know, how much it costs, you know. So we, the, the, the code has different provisions required based on how much it is. I think that the amount that's going to cost is likely going to require, you know, uh, you know multiple bids for the, the, the uh, council to consider. Okay. And Steve McClary, who, who, who on the staff or outside the staff is going to take the pen, so to speak, and, and give us something to shoot at and approve? Um, well, I can work with, um, obviously, several members on my team. Um, one of my key members is out on vacation this week, and we've got the Monday holiday, so it's going to be a, a little ambitious to, to turn this around. Um, I mean, I understand it's a priority for council, but it, it becomes a bit of a, of a fire drill for staff um, if we drop everything that we've got in motion uh, and, and concentrate on this. So, um, I mean kind of what you're asking for here is to try to get something at a special meeting or something out prior to the July 11th council meeting. Well, is, that my, yes, is, that, is that the expectation of council? No, actually, from what I'm hearing is we don't need to have it come back at another meeting, right. have an ad hoc, but yeah, July 11th is, <laughs> so that leaves us three weeks before school starts. You, the, the, uh, you know, you're going right. to put the RFP out. I mean, you're going to probably have, responses for 30 days and when those come back in then that'll come to the council as soon as that's ready right so um does it know, have I'll, to be 30 days can we do some kind of urgency shortener shorter time no that was just a, the the uh I think the standard amount that doesn't have to be 30 days so it, it can be shorter we've all received a uh received received notice of a grant that's available three days before things are due and it's just, you know, it's it's it makes a very very high leap to try and qualify for that in that amount of time. Uh, what I had wanted to mention is that uh, the captain's group has what's called a J team, which is in providing these services to several schools as well. And I don't I don't think that they're the most financially available, but they certainly have a lot of expertise and perhaps they would be willing to talk about uh, trying to get the consultant contract or something like that.
to come in and tell us what they think we need to do as well. And I'd like to see it written broadly enough that anybody who actually knows what they're doing can actually apply to help us. I'm sorry, Trevor. I was going to say, you, you know, for these details on the RFP, you can just direct that the, the, the ad hoc committee works with staff to get that RFP out. I, I don't think, you know, staff will work as, as quickly as possible to get that out. Um, you know, but I don't think you need to set a deadline here tonight about when it goes out, but just to, you know, as quickly as possible. And the ad hoc committee can provide input about how long to keep that open. Okay. I see Bruce and then Karen. Yeah, so uh, could, could we hear from Ethan who talked about his facility and doing experience and facility and doing these things and can, can, we, can we put him on screen or, or no while we talk to him? Um, hi. Hey. hey. Yeah. I don't know if we can see you or just have to talk to a black box, but um, Ethan, could, are you available to help and how quickly can you be of assistance? In um, yeah, I'm, I'm available. Um, I'm on behalf of the Boys and Girls Club, as long as that's what Casey tells me to do. Yes. <laughs> so, I, I mean, how long realistically would you need to give us something that would be in good shape that we could just eyeball it and, you know, maybe propose changes, maybe say thank you, that's a great product and get it out the door? <laughs> yeah, I would say I, um, I can, I can certainly craft the narrative components and take into account some of what the um, what I know the school's concerns are and the school community's concerns are, um, but as far as the details and how it goes out, if the city were to start it, I can do the narrative component. So, well, St Steve, can you Steve McClary, do you work with Ethan or put the right person to work with Ethan? And um, I can't, we can't, I can't make any promises or speak for council, but I would imagine that um, we would have that in our minds when further grants for boys and girls clubs are requested because we we always we're pretty generous i think is that a quid pro quo no <laughs> no <laughs> sure i'm happy to work with mr white um i'll in, i'll engage um with several of our staff and in, including deputy city manager shavelson uh, who is here tonight i'm sorry i forgot to mention that uh, as well as our public safety director susan duenas uh, can also assist with that, and of course, I'll work with the ad hoc committee as well. So to go back, the motion, I guess, is is to do these two RFPs. Um, we're having an ad hoc. It sounds like it's Paul and me, and uh, I, I'm happy not to be on it, but but I'll, I'm also happy to do it. Um, and can can we at least set a um, target of having an RFP out by the end of by the middle of next week? I hate to I hate to hesitate. I mean, we'll do everything we can in our power. Have a to, holiday to next week sure. too. Yeah. Um, be a test of how well we respond to an urgency. Yes. Any other attempts ever seen? I, I let me let me see if this language works for you. The motion would be to put out an RFP for private security services. Put out a, an RFP for consulting services um, to increase security for schools. And then create an ad hoc committee of Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein, Mayor Grisante, and Mayor Grisante to research school safety issues, review and provide input on the RFPs, and report to the City Council on these issues during the next six months. Would that work? During the next six months? <laughs> during the next 45 days. Do you want to make it shorter? Yeah. Okay. During the next 45 days. That works. Right. Okay, Karen, you had your hand raised earlier. Anything else you want to say or can we call the question? Uh, I, I just want to say briefly, and I don't want to throw a wrench into any of this, but there had been some talk about perhaps availability on a temporary basis of some of the Sheriff's Department beach team members. And I'm not sure with Captain C2 uh, if she's able to you know, if she has that kind of flexibility, and I'm just thinking about the beginning of the school year and maybe some kind of an interim period. I'm not trying to complicate things, but I'm just, I, I think it's worth asking. Yes, so um, really what, so with the beach team right now, I am definitely tapped out um, with resources. Um, a lot of deputies are um, working lots of overtime. So once beach team is over, as long as my resources stay at what they are, um, I may be able to provide um, some deputies to schools, or if you 
determine that you don't want them on campus, but want them in a threat assessment role. Um, I can, I think we can definitely talk about that. And um, as long as my staffing stays the same, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I don't know, do we incorporate that into the motion or we just keep that as an ongoing conversation? You can say, I'd say it's an ongoing conversation. What are you thinking, Bruce? Your hands yeah, raised. I'll yeah, I, I think it's an ongoing conversation. Trevor, just one um, tweak to what you said. I don't yeah. think the consultant is for security, the consultant's for safety. Okay, for increasing safety for schools. Yeah. Got it. And does that reflect uh, your motion as you as you would like to propose yeah. it? Otherwise it reflected it. Perfectly. Okay, and the second, who had the second? Mike, you did. I seconded it. Does that, ref does that reflect your, your uh, preference for the motion as well? It's gotten better and better. Thank you for your help. All right, Kelsey, can we take the roll, please? I did just want to check with Trevor. Um, we didn't initially recommend uh, creating an ad hoc on the agenda, but we have sufficient notice for that, you believe? Yes. Then yes, we're ready for a roll call. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us back to 2A. If everybody is ready to listen to people for a while. <laughs> or do we need to, is, does anybody need a break or can we go ahead with this? Let's press on. Pressing on. Item 2A. Yes, you have eight speakers signed up for this item. The first few are Christian Pearson, Bill Sampson, Craig Hill, and Norm Haney. We'll hear from Christian Pearson first. Hi, Christian, are you available? Yes, I am. Good evening, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. So I have a two-part question tonight. Basically, I was curious if the city of Malibu had any plans for the 2.3 acre portion of the La Paz site, otherwise known as affordable housing overlay site number three. And if not, if the city has no plans for it, would the city be willing to dispose of the site? Thank you. Okay, who's our, our next speaker? We have Bill Sampson, followed by Craig Hill, Norm Haney, and Lonnie Gordon. Bill, are you available? I am. Uh, again, thank you for your efforts, all of you, on the, the school problem. I don't have a solution. Now, at the last meeting, a politician, to wit Mrs. Ferrer, complained about remarks to her as if they were political. They were not. They were simply suggesting that a public official had failed in her duties as such, and had taken advantage of the system. The deal on her house at 6244 Bush still stinks. She compared me to former President Trump. I have precisely zero real estate holdings as opposed to 45 or 50, other than my house that is. Uh, I certainly did not take advantage of any kind of system to build another house on a fire rebuilt lot. So apparently you're, you considered my remarks defamatory, Ms. Mrs. Ferrer. I don't recall ever calling you a scumbag. I don't think I did. Here's the definition, a dirty or despicable person. We'll get back to that. Because you proved it later in your remarks. The real estate encyclopedia defines a bottom feeder as someone who profits from the misfortunes or poor management of others, as you did on your home. I frankly don't care what you call me. However, you, the politician, chose to bring my daughter by name into your discussion for political purposes. You have also, for your political purposes, used your private email to attempt to insinuate yourself into, an, into my relationship with some friends in an organization that is completely apolitical and shall always remain sane. You used my daughter's name to make your political points. 
I would call that dirty and despicable. In that regard, she has not lived here since 2003, which you probably knew. Yet you chose to name her in your political discussion. You were utterly lacking in the integrity and the temperament to be a public official and should resign. As to my daughter, shut your damn mouth. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Norman Haney, Lonnie Gordon, and Pamela Conley Ulick. Hi, Craig, are you available? I am. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti and uh, council members and staff. Thank you to John Cotty for his expertise and demeanor, and congratulations to Trevor Rusin. Uh, about three things here tonight. First, um, The Supreme Court over the history has incrementally expanded individual rights until last week. And however anybody feels about abortion itself, uh, doubtless the majority of residents here believe that it should be an individual's right to decide. So the city, like it passed a climate emergency declaration, might consider agendizing uh, some declaration regarding rights, both the privacy rights and the equal protection argument framed by Justice Ginsburg. Um, and the city could play an actual practical role here by helping coordinate between the many wealthy people in town and organizations that fund uh, transportation and other abortion related services. There's a group called the National Network of Abortion Funds that links 90 organizations at abortionfunds.org. There's also a policy group called All Above All. Dot org. Anyway, um, I think the city could kind of help put some of those people together, maybe put a bulletin board on the website or something. I don't know. That's for you guys to discuss. Secondly, running out of time, a couple meetings ago, you seemed like you were about to get to hybrid meetings and Kelsey told you it might take staff about a month to figure out how that would work. And then instead of saying, okay, let's, let's do that, you guys kind of said nothing. So I think let's pick up the ball on that. And then finally, uh, just as a matter of tonight's agenda, I believe that you're required to continue the Big Rock assessment item because the maintenance and modern monitoring report was not publicly noticed. It wasn't available until a few days ago. And some of us didn't even get the letter about tonight's hearing, including me. Craig. Um, yeah, this is this is about tonight's agenda. So if you think if, if 2A I, I think is not about is for items that are not on the agenda. Right. Well, this is about your overall agenda that you need to take that off because you didn't notice the item 72 hours prior to the meeting. So just wanted to point that out. And if you if you still get to it, I'll have more substantive comments on it. But just as a matter of setting tonight's agenda. Um, and anyway, um, that's it. I, I would just hope that um, people take this erosion of rights seriously getting back to my first topic, and that uh, the city could help in coordinating some effort to, to bring people together on that. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Next. Next speaker is Norman Haney, followed by Lonnie Gordon, Pamela Kalmulik, and Ryan. Hey, Norm, are you available? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address uh, the Honorable uh, City Council. Um, I have two things uh, that I'd like to mention. The first is um, I'd like very much to see the city uh, get reinvolved in in-person uh, meetings in the city council. Uh, I think we've seen that in-person meetings uh, are a much better way to communicate. They're more comprehensive uh, form of communication. I think we saw that tonight with Captain C2. Uh, and uh, we saw a lot of passion. Uh, her comments uh, were well taken, much better than if she, you were listening to a black screen. Um, anyone who attended the planning commission when it was in person one time and the city council when it was in person one time uh, will attest to the fact that it's a much better way, more comprehensive way um, to uh, get to the information that's necessary uh, to make a good decision. The second thing I'd like to talk about 
is I'd like to see people come back to work at the city, work in their office. Uh, and I think that's a much more efficient way of getting the job done. I don't believe that um, uh, offsite uh, working from home uh, is the best way to accomplish the city's goals. Um, when you call a person like that, they're never on the phone. You leave a message and hope that they'll call you back. And many times they don't. Now, having said that, there are uh, people in the planning department that do call you back. Richard Mullica uh, and uh, Adrian Fernandez, I got calls from both of them after six o'clock in the evening. Adrian called me at 6.30 to discuss an issue so that it could be resolved and he could move forward. Um, I really appreciate that. And I think that the city should appreciate it. I'm not asking for everybody to, to work after five o'clock. I, I just think it'd be good if they show up for work. And there are a lot of people that do, but there's some some planners uh, and possibly other personnel that don't. And I, I, I'd like to see in-person meetings and I'd like to see in-person people working with other working people. There's just a lot of distractions at home. And having said that, uh, I will tell you, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak uh, to city council tonight. And thank you. Norm, that's okay. Thank you very much, Norm. Who do we have next, Pamela? Our next speaker is Lonnie Gordon, followed by Pamela Conley Ulick, Ryan, and Mary Ann Rickens. Lonnie, are you there? I am here. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Well, you know, I want to say before I read my little thing that I wrote for you tonight, and good evening, Mayor and Council, that I had a conversation with Richard Mollica. So Richard will be able to answer some of the questions that I'm going to bring up here. Um, I hoped I, I would have hoped to have lightened this conversation, but I'm not sure I am. I've been following up on the information I was given by LA County Planning and our own planning department regarding the large orange and white tower by the SMCC. Richard had told me that the entire project is controlled by the Department of State Architects, that's called DSA, for those who want to investigate the tower, the tower number is 03-115508. I spoke with the DSA and they referred me to a supervisor of the project and the field engineer who was there every day. Well, number one, it's county property. The county never received an application or issued a permit for this, on this, for this property or for this tower. Number two, our city never received an application or issued a permit that I had been told of yet. And it requires a conditional use permit as required by condition number 17 of our planning commission, resolution number 16-30, if it's obtained, whatever that might mean. I'm not sure it hasn't been explained to me. The DSA does not issue permits. They only inspect the job that, and make sure it's structurally correct. So they have nothing to do with that tower. I'm gonna to do a formal request for plans unless our planning department has them. And if so, I'd like to know who signed off as the architect so we can find out what's going on. We need to get to the bottom of why this monstrous and aesthetically unpleasing tower was ever conceived and, and built. There's already a cell site with a generator on the side of the library. So this is not really needed. The walkways that have been built around the tower look as if the cell sites might be installed, although Richard says they will not be. Then why are they there? Is there anyone who thinks this is okay? And as, finally, as a reminder, I've not received an answer about the California, um, the CCC letter to our planning department dated July 21st, 2021 regarding our ordinance or planning's response, even after hiring a consultant for $21,000 to answer the questions. What is the status with the California Coastal Commission and our ordinance? Thank you. I appreciate you listening to me tonight and I appreciate what you do. Thank you, Lonnie. Our next speaker is Pamela conley ulick followed by Ryan and Marianne Rickens. Welcome back, Pamela. 
Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for your service and your time and your energy. It's exhausting since the Woolsey fire and just tonight being on this and hearing some of the acrimony and hurtful things that people are saying. It's just God bless you all is all I can say. And I'm here tonight to ask about um, safety for our community. The flock cameras, I understand, are here. And the question is, when will they be installed? Can you talk about that? I hope you will get them installed sooner rather than later. Um, I am so grateful for Captain Sito and all of her wonderful comments. And she mentions the uh, school res resource officers and how important they are in helping um, prevent the violence in the schools. And I am going to ask you to really consider a community resource officer based on the, the, the things I'm reading and next door and the comments even tonight. There's, I feel there's a need for, I don't know, I know people have called it an ombudsman, but I would say a mental health professional to help you and the city and the residents. So I think it's great they're going to have this at the school, but I'm very concerned the way our community is going. And I think it's just been since Woolsey and now COVID, you know, this is not anything um, just in our community, it's in our country. And I wish that you would look at that seriously, a mental health resource and maybe the library money that we're gonna look at later, maybe that's a way that you could do that. We already hired the security guards for the library. Why not put in a, a, a um, mental health resource or a community resource officer? I really feel it's needed right now. Um, lastly, the Point Doom Parade is gonna be Monday, thanks to Doug Randall. Um, his number is 310-773-7132 for any donations or help and also the Point Doom Community Services District and all of those volunteers, they're going to be expanding their services, thank goodness, to include public safety. And we're gonna be looking, uh, thanks to CERT and also Rich Garvey um, for the Point Doom, they're gonna be looking at community disaster um, services in addition to the fire boxes like they have in Malibu West. So I'm really grateful for CERT. They're gonna be participating again. Thank you, Paul and Sarah Grisanti. Um, Karen, you were there and all the people who participate and help bring the community together. I really hope that we can come together and be, get stronger together. We may disagree and I heard Mr. Sampson and Karen Fair, what they were saying back and forth. I'm not following it, but I just hope you can meet in person because life is just simply- Pamela, that's your time. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Pamela. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Marianne Riggin. Mr. Embry. I too wanted to comment that um, I attended the Public Works Commission meeting um, last week and the issue of uh, wireless uh, antenna poles in the city is one of the duties specified in the municipal code for the Public Works Commission to handle. And yet um, there seems to be some issues that need to be resolved within the, the structure of the city government to make sure that that actually occurs. Um, I'm, I'm confident that uh, the city manager uh, is aware of it and can rectify that but it's very clear that the city council assigned those duties to public works commission that were previously handled uh, by the telecommunications commission, which I did serve on. The, this poll in the civic center is the very reason why you need to reestablish a telecommunications commission if the public works department itself is reluctant to staffing review of these types of monstrosity mistakes. I'm talking about the size of the mistake being a monstrosity. This is uh, a pole that needs to be removed. It needs to be unscrewed, just like it was screwed together in sections and erected. It is not permitted. It needs to lay on the ground in bits and pieces because it's going to take a while before any of this can be sorted out. There's a letter uh, in the city records and files which relates to this tower and it is from the FAA 
and it's from Nicholas, I think his name is Sanders, and he had, I, he isn't admonishing, but he is explaining quite clearly that all local uh, approvals state also have to uh, be um, met for this project. And that obviously was not done. And that letter is from March and we're now in June and still no application. So I understand that it's a county, but the county should not be getting a free pass or preferential treatment here because they they drew a picture, a watercolor picture showing that there was a tower on, on their, their latest plans. The tower was a four post tower shown that it would be bolted to the flat first story roof in the rear of the project above the emergency communications room. Actually, the room that was there, they tore down at the sheriff's station, the exact location where it was. And that's completely different than what their relocated 75 foot pole is. And that pole has a 75 foot radius fall zone. When it catches on fire, it's gonna hit the building or set the brush on fire. So please remove it. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Marianne Riggins, followed by Howard Rudsky. Hi, Marianne, are you available? Hi, I am, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that I think it's time uh, for you to start having in-person meetings again. Um, it's, as it was experienced on the one meeting that you did have, I think that um, it allows speakers to have a better interaction with the council and for council to be able to see the speakers that are in front of them. Um, as Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein was mentioning, uh, being able to see the other speakers is a benefit. And I think that that being done in person would be in incredibly helpful. So I would encourage you to schedule in-person meetings beginning as quickly as possible so that uh, normal business can resume. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Our next speaker is Howard Rudsky. Hi, Howard, are you available? Mr. Rudsky, are you available? I am, good evening. First, I'd like to thank Lieutenant, Lieutenant C2 for the amazing presentation and the passion for something that's really dear to all of us and an urgent need. And the second thing is the pole that's in the center of town. It's not only <laughs> us. <laughs> I was in Europe and this thing's an embarrassment everywhere. It seems people know about it. And you can only imagine what the neighbors go through looking at it. So my suggestion is if we can get Joyce to deal with it with somebody from BBK and maybe Lieutenant C2, if she has something to say about what this thing looks like and how it's situated and put some urgency to it. Because I think it takes somebody like Joyce, because Richard's too busy, that has all the experience with the different agencies to get this thing taken care of. Because in my opinion, whoever was in charge of taking care of this for the county or the state or whomever took us for fools. And I think we have to make them aware that that's not possible and there's a lot of pushback. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. And Mayor, I don't have any other speaker signups or see any raised hands from the public. So that concludes public comment. And so we've now had public comment. Uh, do we have any commission or committee or city manager updates? You don't have any commission or committee updates, so I turn to the city manager. Hey, Steve, can you enlighten us, please? Well, that's a tall order, but I'll do my best. Happy to give you a report, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'll try to be somewhat brief here. Um, as usual, I typically start off with a report on what's happening with COVID. Uh, probably no surprise to those who've been paying attention. Uh, they're uh, seeing an increase, particularly in the testing positivity rate. 
the seven day daily average is now hovering around 10%, uh, and it has jumped up considerably. It was around 4% uh, only four weeks ago. So we are seeing a definite increase in community transmission. Uh, hospitalizations are also up. Uh, on June 24th, the county uh, uh, bed count for hospitalizations attributed to COVID was at 762. And just a reminder, we were back in the low 200s uh, in April before this more recent surge. Uh, deaths are trending downward, which uh, is a, a good indicator there. Um, we will be getting another update from uh, the county health later this week. And I will continue to keep the county uh, keep the council advised on where we are trending on this. Uh, so far, no indications from the county uh, that we are uh, into or, or going to be entering into uh, the high transmission level. Of course, if we hit that level again, the county would be likely looking at imposing additional safety measures, uh, including indoor masking. So we are not there at this point. Also wanted to uh, report ag again, just to remind everybody that uh, Caltrans is holding a virtual community meeting to discuss its PCH paving project uh, for Malibu residents. Uh, this is going to be held tomorrow evening, Tuesday, June 28th from 6 to 7 p.m. This project is going from approximately the Malibu Lagoon uh, west to Leo Carrillo. Information is on the city's website or in the city manager update. Again, it is a it is a virtual meeting that is being hosted by Caltrans. Uh, quickly wanted to report that um, uh, Planning Director uh, Malika and I had a meeting today with a representative from Pepperdine to learn a little bit more about uh, their new athletic um, center that they are going to be building there, along with some additional parking. So. I'll put together some information uh, to the council members on that. I also participated last week in some training uh, by, through, that was put together through our CERT radio folks. I wanna thank them for that. And I'm gonna try to get out so that I can get to meet the, the CERT volunteers and get to know a little bit more about the operations there. So thank you for that. Last week, I did attend the meeting of the of, um, Las Virgins Malibu Council of Governments uh, governing board. They did a, adopt a, a budget for the coming fiscal year. And also wanted to report that I recently uh, met along with our building official Yolanda Bundy uh, with the representative from the LA County Sustainability Office uh, to hear more about uh, their programs and what they uh, have to offer and how they might be able to work with the city and us with them. Uh, and I was happy to report that they noted uh, the large number of programs that the city uh, is already doing in that area and that the Malibu uh, actually is setting a very good um, example for other cities to follow. So it was nice to hear that recognition from the LA County Sustainability Office. Also wanted to note that um, city staff did meet last week with uh, Coastal Commission staff regarding fire rebuild option number four. Uh, so we are making progress on that matter. Uh, we're working to gain clarity uh, on the Coastal Commission's position. Um, we did request that meeting and held that meeting and it included uh, their legal counsel as well as their district director. Staff is working vigorously to uh, get an item to city council at your next regular meeting on July 11th so that we can get some direction from council on how would you like to, how you would like staff to proceed on this matter, including those projects that are temporarily on hold. Um, let's see. Also, later this week, we'll be holding a meeting with the um, representative of the Sheriff's Department to talk about the staffing options uh, for the Malibu substation. Hard to believe, but about a year from now, we uh, could be talking about a grand opening for that station. I know there was some discussion about response times when we talked about the school safety item early on. So I'm happy to report that we are making progress to getting that station opened. Uh, and likely by July 1st. And again, we are working on those options and we will be bringing those to the council and the community um, for discussion and direction. And let's see, uh, there were some comments also about um, people desiring to see the city council meeting back in person. So I'll let them know council that right now we have that discussion 
scheduled coming back to you for your August 8th meeting. So that would be after the break, the first meeting after the break. Um, and then also, if I would like to call a couple of staff members, I'd like to call Susan Duenas to give us a report on what is happening uh, with the camera systems. Thank you, Susan. Hi. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, I know uh, some people probably are wondering why it's taking so long. Uh, part of it, if you recall, when we originally got permission to pursue the cameras by the council, uh, we were advised to enter into a memorandum of an understanding with the sheriff's department in order to manage the data for the cameras. Uh, while we were waiting for that MOU to be completed, which I think it's almost done now, <laughs> it was also brought to our attention that this the sheriff's existing uh, camera system, the system that they primarily use, is not flock. It's vigilant. And vigilant, we don't need an MOU. <laughs> because it's their existing system. The other issue, um, John Cotty, the city attorney, the previous city attorney, um, anyways, he had concerns that Flock had a 30 day retention period on data. The sheriff's permit also had concerns about that because 30 days is not very long for some crimes. Vigilant has a retention period of five years. So in terms of meeting requirements but for public records requests, which we won't be handling, the sheriff's department will be, it's a better time frame than flop. And the cameras used by Vigilant are more powerful for the volume of traffic on Pacific Coast Highway. That was another thing we did not understand about flop. Flock is great for neighborhoods where it's a smaller volume, but the cameras that Vigilant has are more powerful. So we're going with Vigilant. I have every, all the documentation. In fact, I was finishing that today and we'll be doing the PO tomorrow. I'll be putting in all the paperwork for that. Thank you, Susan. And then if I could call on our planning director, Richard Malika, to give a brief update on what is happening with the communications tower at the college. Good evening, mayor and members of the city council. Just to give you a quick update on where we are with the tower that's on the college property, uh, just as a start as a quick reminder for everyone, on February 29th of 2016, the Planning Commission processed a variance through a public hearing process to approve the height of that tower of 75 feet. That was then uh, routed to the City Council. The item, the whole college project was appealed to the Coastal Commission in May of 2016, and on June of 2016, the Coastal Commission found no substantial issue with the appeal. Uh, we did receive Mr. Embry's correspondence. The plans showing the tower that he mentioned were preliminary plans that were drawn up prior to the submittal of the project to the city. The plans that went before the Planning Commission and in the packet that went to the Council as well up as well as to the Coastal Commission are the plans that you see in the memorandum that is on the city's website. And you see the communications tower identified on those plans. Last Friday, I was contacted by Santa Monica City College regarding the fulfillment of the condition placed on the project by the Planning Commission, which was to obtain the use permits for the tower. Uh, as I mentioned, the tower has a coastal development permit for the structure, but no use permits. And those were required before any antennas uh, or radio equipment could be used on the site. So the, I want to let you know that SMC has con contacted us about that. We have a meeting with SMC on Thursday where we want to understand a bit more about the tower and the review of the other agencies. The city's uh, jurisdiction on this is limited to planning because of our local coastal program. It falls within our sphere of influence for planning. And so that's why they received a, a, a planning approval through the CDP process. Uh, but unlike the residential or commercial construction in the city, it did not go in, um, to be plan checked before uh, our building, the building department or building official. And building permits were not issued by the city, only that planning permit. So we do have a meeting with them this coming Thursday, 
And as well, I've been following up with the project manager on site for Venere Construction. Um, and I had also requested from him, and he seems to be willing to comply with us, if he could give us some sort of documentation showing that DSA looked at the tower as the construction team on site insists that uh, DSA has been um, on site daily conducting inspections on the construction, as well as they were the ones to review and issue a structural plan check on the tower. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to uh, answer those. And on a separate note, on the city's wireless update, our consultant has prepared a draft response to the Coastal Commission's comments. That draft was uh, reviewed uh, by our planning department. We actually sent our comments back to our consultant today. And so ideally within about a week or two, we'll be getting that up to the Coastal Commission staff and then offer to have a follow-up meeting with them uh, to see if there's any clarification they need or additional materials as a response of our resubmittal to them. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I see that Bruce has got his hand raised. Perhaps he has a question for you. I do have a couple questions. Um, Richard, I'm uh, trying to digest the information you provided about the tower that a number of people spoke about. Um, is it correct or incorrect that the size, shape, color, and all other details of that tower have been approved by the city in connection with issuing the um, CDP? The only difference that we could find, now I don't have a, a survey on the height, uh, but we did do a site inspection. We looked at the plans and the specs and they did match, uh, the, the plans are on site in the construction trailer did match the dimensions on the set of plans the city approved. However, what I noticed and I, I think is that in all of the, and I think anybody else looking at it will see, when you look at the conceptual drawings of all of this, uh, they just show it as a white tower. Uh, I have not yet found a document or I'm look, you know, trying to look at the plans in the city records. Did somebody write a note about coloring or anything like that? And at this point, what I'm seeing is that it was just a, a white structure. But, but the, you're saying the shape of it is, is part of what was approved by the city? It does match the, the shape of the, the, the structure, the, so the monopole is specifically called out and then the triangular antenna mounts that are on it, those, those platforms, uh, I forget if the number was 12 or 14 feet, but they were actually dimensioned on the plans. Okay. And we found that on our plans and the trailer, construction trailer plans, that dimension to match. Okay, now were, were those plans that match what's there except for the color, uh, submitted to the planning department, I'm sorry, the planning commission when it approved the CDP that was subject to an appeal, or did those plans come into existence after that? No, they were the plans. Uh, what we did is we pulled the plans that were part of the agenda packet that went to the planning commission. Uh, I, no, this was not, uh, I didn't want to, yeah, I didn't want to see any construction changes. What I wanted to see was what did our decision makers see at the time? And they saw the same thing that you're saying supports everything except for perhaps the color. That is correct. And uh, trying to do multiple screens here, <laughs> but if you uh, take a peek at the city's memorandum, I want to say it's, if I could go faster, or my computer could handle it. Um, it's loading as we speak here. Um, you, you've to up your budget. Sorry. Trying to get you the page number. I'm that's, sorry. That's, that's, that's okay. I'm, I'm going to take your word for that. You, you, you've answered my question. The last question I have is, um, and I'm not sure it matters in terms of whether we'd have any discretion, but um, you mentioned also a building permit. Did we ever issue a building permit? No, we wouldn't have on something like this uh, because of jurisdiction. So the uh, building permit's not required from the city? Not from the city, that's correct. It's a use permit is required from the city as well as a coastal development permit. Okay, so it, am I correct then in, in, in distilling everything you've said that it, everything was done according to the plans that the city approved except perhaps the use? That is correct. They do not have use permits. And so those are applications that they would file with the city and would go before the planning commission uh, there'd be a public hearing to approve those, and they would be appealable to this council. 
but it sounds like it's your it's your judgment based on everything you've just said that we don't have any dog in the fight as far as the way it has been put together other, other than perhaps the color the color is something i'd like to look into and and that's correct we it, we did approve it and there was an appeal period and it has run out for the structure but we we do have our ability on the use of it and that's what's going to go before the city now all right Th thank you appreciate the answers if, if that was already said and i'm dense i apologize no problem okay. and and lastly if i could mr mayor i apologize if i can please call um Lieutenant Waters to give a brief report on uh, what's happening with the uh, police. Are you available, Lieutenant Waters? Yes, just waiting for my video to start. Took a minute for him to let me in. All right. Hey, how are you, Council, Mayor, City Manager? Just wanted to uh, run down the stats for the month of May. Um, during the month of May, uh, we saw a slight spike in vehicle uh, burglaries, locked vehicle burglaries. Um, these, all these uh, burglaries occurred both on trailheads and pocket beaches, and, and one at the uh, at Surf Rider. So. Quick reminder to those who are out on the trailheads, lock your vehicles, keep your, don't keep any personal items inside them. Uh, be really cognizant of that. If you're a surfer, don't hide your keys. Those are being used too. It's still a vehicle burglary if someone takes your keys and steals something out of your vehicle. So really be cognizant of that. Uh, none of them were taken from actual uh, residents' homes. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, Unlocked vehicles are down. That's 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 a good thing. So uh, it's just careful with those locked vehicles, I suppose. Um, we're looking at a few incidents. I know people have a lot of questions on the robbery that occurred on Heathercliff and PCH, the armed robbery. Um, that is currently under investigation. We have the vehicle of the suspect, as well as uh, some other items of evidence that were inside the vehicle that tie him to the uh, to this crime, and we are currently in the middle of investigation on that. So hopefully we'll have some results for that for the next time we come uh, and talk to you in a couple weeks. Uh, other than the burglaries, we've been doing a really good job at uh, keeping traffic at a minimum here on PCH. I know some people might think it's it's a little bit more than usual, but it is summer months, and we have to remember that there are a lot more people out on the road. But during this time, we've uh, experienced a reduction in traffic collisions. Um, we had three DUI collisions, uh, seven DUI arrests. So that's the, the arrests are up on DUIs. Uh, total collisions, we had 23 in the city and no fatalities. So that's really good. We've written 923 citations, 718 of those were moving violations or hazardous citations. So we're really getting out there and trying to slow people down. When it comes to uh, some of the operations we've been conducting over the last couple months for uh, the traffic issues, we conducted a DUI checkpoint in the city of Malibu. We also did a speed uh, operation on PCH where it netted several citations and towed a couple vehicles. And it has some uh, cited vehicles for modified exhaust. I sent I think it was my entire my entire uh, motor team to a CHP class, which focused on both speeding, racing, and modified vehicles, and learning how to send those vehicles to a uh, state uh, referee. So put a sticker on one of those sites. Vehicle is no longer operable on so the county or city highway, and. At that point, they have to have the vehicle inspected within 30 days before they can bring it back out and brought back to stock. So that's, a, that's been very, very uh, helpful for us so far, especially on these Saturday and Sunday car show and runs through the city. So we're, we're experiencing about anywhere from three to 10 of those um, a weekend that we're writing. 
Uh, we also did, or we're also going to be working on the overnight campers. Oh, it's a big problem right now with it getting warmer out. So that's going to we're doing an operation this week on that. And uh, it's continued every single day we're working on it. But you might not see the results right away, but we are siding every single night. So it takes a few sites for these things to get built up to where they stop paying the sites. And once they don't pay the sites, <laughs> then we can start towing them. So that's that's what we're really working on right now. Um, and we're addressing the illegal vendors along PCH too. There was only a few uh, actual permits issued in the city of Malibu. And I know exactly where those are and I have my staff go out and hit these people that are out there with food trucks, strawberry trucks on the side of the road, causing uh, traffic hazards and trying to address that as well. You have any questions for me? I see Bruce uh, has his hand raised. Yeah, I do. I'm, I'm glad to hear about the um, few vehicles that have been caught for excess noise. Just wondering, is, is there any, you know, not an hour goes by, especially on the weekends, without an, a, you know, three, four, five motorcycles or cars together going down PCH making a huge amount of noise. Um, is there any way we can have like a concerted effort some weekend or weekends to crack these just all day, catch those, those noise polluters and um, send a message that this is not a place to come to ride your noisy vehicles up and down the highway? Yeah, we're working on that. We've got a lot of information from residents, especially along the area over by Dukes, between there and Moon Shadows. I guess there's a pretty long straightaway right there where people just open up or leave in the, uh, the stoplights there at Big Rock. So we're going to be putting together an operation here in the next uh, month or so to address that on the Friday and Saturday nights, because that seems to be the biggest nights. I know it's every night, but no, Friday and Saturday about, nights are the biggest nights. I'm talking about during the during the day, and it's certainly not limited to Dukes. It's the center of town. It's Point Doom area. It's down by Zoom. It's, it's the entire stretch of PCH. We do it every Sunday, sir. So every Sunday we have an operation out there. We have at least two motors, a supervisor, and another traffic unit out there as well as being able to tow. We have the ability to tow now that we have the uh, temporary tow yard down there and the trucks, it's easier. So we are addressing it on every Sunday. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for everything you're doing, by the way. I don't well, thank you, sir, I appreciate that. Well, that was a question I had. <laughs> Chad? We're trying. Yes, sir. I was uh, one of the people who was at the car uh, Thing sponsored by the city that's at uh, Bluffs Park yesterday and uh, somewhere between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, there was uh, a, a guy coming from Los Angeles in a, I think it was a white Tesla who decided to try drifting as he turned onto Malibu Canyon and ran into a truck. Was And then the guy ran away. Did that Was that guy captured? No, he was not, but we got a license plate off him. Uh, by the time we got to the, because uh, he was coming up Malibu Canyon, that's the way he escaped. By the time we got up to all the outlets up there, he never came through. So he must have jumped onto another uh, side road or canyon road and got out of that way because he didn't come up through Las Virginas. Okay. Yeah, but we have a license plate. We're working on it. Good. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, that brings us to uh, time for a short break and then the, uh, the council people will provide their descriptions of what they've done. Is everyone okay with that? It's now 9.13. Why don't we uh, show up back here at uh, 9.21? An eight minute break, okay. <laughs> You want 10 minutes, take the 10 minutes, Bruce. Okay, I just think eight was kind of arbitrary. That's all.
Hey, Paul. Karen as needs to be let into the meeting. I'm, I'm calling right now, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we should have that issue resolved shortly and Council Member Ferris should be joining us. There she is. Welcome back. Okay. Uh, we're returning to welcome back everybody. Mikey, I see your hand raised. Yeah, it's just for city council comments, that's all. You're ready. So all we're right. on item 2C, so please. All righty. Um... I want to thank all the speakers um, for taking the time to share their thoughts. I'm going to go over not every one of them, but uh, a few things. Uh, Christian Pearson, who I don't think is here anymore and has no relation. Um, <clears throat> your question on the 2.3 acres uh, behind La Paz, you seem to be related to affordable housing. Very curious what you're thinking. <clears throat> if you uh, hear this message somehow or that I'm speaking to you, I don't know who you are or how they find you. I'd love to know what you're thinking. Uh, please feel free to get a hold of me. Be curious about that. Um, Craig Hill. Um, yeah, our rights are, are changing in ways that we haven't seen in a very long time. And uh, it is uh, a different time right now in the United States, I would have to say. And um, it's not lost to me that our government can send people to die if it decides to, but uh, <clears throat> this decision was very interesting to me. And the right, the decision to have an abortion or not is obviously very powerful and very personal. <clears throat> but um, I, uh, I hear what you're saying. Norm and a uh, <clears throat> couple, excuse me, the oatmeal cookie I snuck in during the break, it's apparently not entirely been swallowed. Um, Norm and uh, I know other people, Marianne, um, I feel like somebody else probably talked about in-person meetings. I completely agree how much more um, engaging and powerful they are. Um, I will say I find myself in a very unique situation I've never been in, where at this point I simply, due to medical reasons, could not attend a meeting that long inside in public. I'm ever more engaged in taking care of um, family in their 90s that are very frail, and it's just, I don't know how to do both safely. Um, um, I have not figured that out yet. Um, I mean, everything I can not to get COVID and being very, very safe. Uh, with that said, uh, I totally agree. In-person meetings are, are better. Um, if I was even to go to an a meeting in person, I'd have a mask on, so you <laughs> wouldn't help anyone read my expressions any better anyhow. Um, so I, I still am concerned. I know a lot of people with COVID right now. Um, 
Some of them are, if they're vaccinated, they're sick, but not overly sick. The one or two people I know that weren't fully vaxxed are quite sick. So, and I I just simply can't risk getting my my uh, family members sick, uh, the older ones. Um, the tower at the college. I was on the planning commission then, and I got I got to pull back up this. I'm sure Richard knows where it is now because it's been a subject of controversy. I had to pull this item back up and look because, for the life of me, as much as we talked about this, the tower was never mentioned. It was yeah, we knew it was there. It was replacing another tower. It was never, as I remember, unless I'm totally blinking, it was not the subject of discussion. There was other items we were talking about. It was a very, you know, intensive project. I had, so to see the size and scale of it, maybe it's the way it's painted, but also how thick and tubular it is, was completely shocking to me, just, just to be honest. I had no idea it would be right there, no idea it would look like that. But maybe it just was not a big focus of that meeting. So I, I do need to review those notes because uh, it is surprising to me. Um, good to hear about the cameras. I was, uh, myself and Chris Frost were in the original meeting with Captain Becerra and Jim Braden uh, when they asked for the flock system. Um, if Vigilant, great. Don't know the name. Don't care what the name is. Uh, I'm glad to see we get that going. I think it really, really will help out when we need it to. Uh, so good work on figuring out what's going on there. Um, as far as option four, I'm glad a meeting happened with Coastal. <clears throat> I remain, I just, I just feel sorry for people that are caught in that uh, with no fault of their own, and, you know, that they did what they thought the process was and, whether we had it right or wrong is besides the issue, but we have residents that are panicking right now. They are panicking. They're, you know, they're out of rental money. They, you know, they just got caught completely off guard by that. And that's, that's a shame to me. That's a huge shame. So I look forward to seeing this come back. Uh, um, beyond that, I think that's it. Uh, another thanks to uh, Captain C2. She's just such an impressive human being. Sorry, one second. I make sure I didn't miss anything. <clears throat> Fourth of July coming up, Point Doom Parade. What a great tradition. We have our traditions here in Malibu West. We'll be having our very cute little kid parade here. Um, one of the great reasons to live here. And as far as my activities, I brought an long collected huge amount and wasn't just all mine um, pile of electronic waste to the city's electronic waste recycling uh what a great event and it was, it had paint and all that which I, i'd known that i brought some old paint but uh um, what a great crew there uh they did a really good job it was really well set up i encourage everyone to collect your electronic waste uh and old paint if you have it too i think we do the event about every six months is my guess I had had some, I'd been collecting for a number of months. Um, really well done. They're really organized. They're really helpful. Um, I'm really glad the city does that. <clears throat> really environmentally much better. Um, also was at a chamber mixer. And the only point there is it's great to see the local uh, business community so engaged. It was a really good get together. It was uh, people really, uh, really in the mood. It was outdoor or sort of outdoor. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, Paul was there actually. And uh, it was, it was, uh, it had, it had an energy of people really wanting to uh, connect. And that was nice to see. Uh, um, of course, we have ongoing school team meetings um, and may have mediation coming up. It seems like we're not sure. So a lot going on there. Uh, moving forward, it's, um, I'll, I'll let Karen comment on it if, if she wants to, but we are moving forward. And the last thing I want to say is back to the Santa Monica College. There is on their website a survey you can do, and I'd love to see the city put this out. Um, Steve's shaking his head like maybe he already has, and I just don't know it. But there's a survey on what people want to see at the Malibu campus. 
and it's on their website. It's a long website. It's smc.edu forward slash about forward slash campuses forward slash Malibu forward slash survey. But if you just put SMC survey, you can find it in Google and it asks a whole lot of questions about what the community would love to see there. And uh, it'd be great if we can try and get as many residents um, to answer that. It's anything from credit classes, non-credit classes, art, live performances. Um, it really goes on and on. It uh, takes maybe seven, eight minutes to do it right. And uh, it'd be great if um, more people participated in that because it's going to be a great resource for the community. And uh, thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, and I don't see any hands, so I'll jump in and, and confess to being at the chamber mixer and running into Mikey there. And we had a wonderful time. And uh, it was at uh, Sunset Restaurant and watching the nice evening traffic problem on Westford Beach was always fun to do but nobody got hurt, that's a good thing. Uh, I also took the survey that Mikey just mentioned. Uh, it was in my email, so I took it and sent it. And the other thing that I did that was the most fun was on Saturday was the opening of the surf art exhibit at City Hall. And staff did an incredible job of uh, displaying the art, the art, uh, the Art Council did a wonderful job of uh, asking for people to, for submissions. They had over 300 submissions and, and we don't have room for anywhere near that much. And they were ended up being very, very selective. Everything that you will see there will make you go, oh my God, this is really great stuff. I can't urge everyone enough to go to the downstairs of City Hall and walk over by the entrance to the um, to the meeting room there, and and take a look at what's there. And and one of the things that they're doing this time, they've in, included the artists' uh, emails, so you can contact the artist if you might want to buy or see some of their other pieces. So I think that that's uh, part of the value we're adding for it. And I think that the gallery just keeps getting better and better. And Steve Earing, it's up to you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's getting late, so I'm going to try and keep it short. Uh, the biggest event I attended this over, over the last couple of weeks was the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission meeting. Uh, and they, they focused on the last two meetings on water, all right, trying to find ways to either capture storm water, refill some of the cisterns in the ground, and or uh, the Las Virginis, uh Water District has got a huge project going on where they're going to start coming. They they get it designed and they're going to start building a plan to go back and recycle water. So the idea is to take all the water that is currently either flowing into the ocean or being deposited in Malibu Creek, send that through a, a cleansing process, and basically coming out with water on the other end that you can drink. Uh, and they plan on having that done sometime by 20, 2027. Uh, I mean, and I think everybody there sort of acknowledges that this water issue we have is not going to go away very quickly. Uh, so it's just amazing the amount of effort and time they're putting in to try and come up with solutions to help us do that. Uh, and as we get a little further down the line, uh, I will bring back more information, uh, but this is going to be one heck of a project. And they've got, and I don't know if they do demos up there, but they've got a demo system set up so they can sh show you exactly how it's all supposed to work. Uh, they gave it to us as a uh, part of our meeting, and I don't know if they're conducting tours for other people, but I'll try and find out. So if anybody's interested in going up and take a look at that, uh, I'll let you know. Uh, second thing is, I got a, a bunch of calls over the last couple of weeks regarding the tow yard over at uh, Heathercliff that nobody was towing any cars. Um, so, the, you know, the question, what the hell are we doing? And I guess Sunday they picked up like 13 or 14 cars and put it in there. So I think it was just a matter of time before we started catching some of those people. And apparently there's a couple of large trucks up there, under construction trucks. I don't know if they're ours or they're somebody else's, uh, but the same people who we were talking to me about using the tow yard or not, you know, are concerned with what the heck's going on up there. So if somebody wants to take a look 
at those trucks and make sure that they're supposed to be there. I don't know. Again, I can't tell if they're city trucks or uh, you know, construction trucks that people were working with. But if they're not supposed to be there, we may want to get rid of them. And then finally, I was one of the people that voted against Trevor as our interim city manager. And next meeting is getting laid. I'll take a little time to explain about why I made that vote. So, Paul, back to you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's either Bruce or Karen at this point. Bruce? I, I can go. Karen, you're ready. Good. Uh, yeah, Mikey covered a lot of the comments I would have made. So, thank you, Mikey. Um, the one thing about the e waste uh, collection, I was under the impression it was quarterly. Steve McClary, do you know the answer to that? I'm sorry, council member, you caught me off guard. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Let me see if somebody in else and staff here can get can get that information to you. Okay, I, I, I'm sure it's more than every six months, um, but maybe we ought to remind people of how frequently it is. Um, yeah, I also filled out the Santa Monica College survey. I spoke to someone today um, who wasn't who was asking me if I had filled it out because she just did. She said that there were very few responses. I don't know how she knows. Um, but anyway, I would also encourage people to please go on the Santa Monica College website and um, just look for the Malibu survey. Um, my activity, uh, as we discussed earlier, we had the school safety partnership meeting. Um, the school district separation team continues to meet. Uh, on the 21st, I had the monthly COG meeting. And one thing to come out of that is that Tessa Charnovsky of Supervisor Kuehl's office let us know that there would be a Homeless Connect Day in Malibu in either September or October. So I'm happy to see that that um, is able to be resumed. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? Okay. Um, so over the past couple of weeks, um, I have met with the city manager to discuss numerous issues, including what to do about this two-step rebuild process, what kind of relief can we afford to people who are caught in the pipeline. Uh, we talked about the tower that was the subject of some comments tonight. I'll, I'll get back to that in a few minutes. And just general management philosophy issues. Very good conversation. Um, I attended remotely a, a Superior Court hearing on the um, petition that was filed by the um, Malibu Beach Inn hotel owners to um, overturn our denial of their permit application. And uh, it was a very good result. The judge threw their case out. Um, he has not made that final yet. There's some procedural quirk that, that they have to be given like two weeks or something after the court tells them what the decision is to accept it or something. But in any event, it was a very good result. The judge, judge was very impressive. Um, he wrote a lengthy opinion in advance of the hearing uh, for the parties to take shots at. And um, after practicing law for a long time and seeing some really good judges, I was just, I was, I'm not often impressed by judges. I was very impressed by this judge. Uh, and I watched about five or six of his hearings before our hearing came up and he just was impressive with every hearing that he had. Um, I have done some due diligence over the course of the week on the question, uh, over the course of the past two weeks for the um, replacement city attorney. You know, Trevor's now our interim city attorney. Hopefully uh, we are gonna have a formal process for selecting a permanent city attorney, uh, which maybe be, may be Trevor. Um, maybe someone else. Chris, you know, Christy Hogan was the city attorney forever. BBK succeeded to her contract, I think, almost by default. And um, as best I can tell, there really hasn't been a formal search for a city attorney for a long time. So um, I, I think it's time to do that. Probably have probably wait till the um, till November before we formalize that. Um, I, I participate in weekly meetings with CalStrat. I have to admit, I miss. I probably miss as many meetings as I attend, but Paul is a stalwart. He's there every week. Um, so that's that's good. And we're gonna be talking about them later, perhaps. Um, I know they're on the consent calendar. Um, I've had communications with multiple residents over the past two weeks about this two-step rebuild process issue. I'm gonna be speaking to some of them later this week as well. Um, I have to admit there have been 
a great number of comments have come up about Karen's project. Um, numerous issues have been raised. I, I don't have any judgment on that. I'm actually looking at the, at the file, trying to figure out for myself. Um, I've heard Karen's side that she says everything is above board and um, I'm looking at the materials myself to be satisfied as well. Um, multiple communications regarding school safety, which we had our hearing earlier. Um, on the Heathercliff impound lot um, or yard, I have heard, I've been told, I don't know whether it's true that the drip pans are not being used. They're not there prophylactically. They're only there in case they're actually needed. So that's contrary, I think, to what we were told we were approving. Uh, I thought they're supposed to be under each vehicle that's there from the time the vehicle is brought there till the time the vehicle leaves. And what I'm being told is, no, they're, they're, they're there in a pile somewhere. And if the car looks like it needs a drip pan, I guess after the fact, it'll be there. So I, I hope that someone's gonna take a look at that. Um, I understand for the 4th of July, there's no, no one has pulled a permit for fireworks. I'm hopeful that our sheriff's deputies will be watching for illegal fireworks and making arrests if necessary because um, they are a fire hazard. And in connection with that, I hope we're getting ready to bring back our urgency ordinance from last year um, as we're getting into fire season. Seems like fire season is 12 months a year, but we're definitely getting into the defined fire season. And we did have an ordinance last year prohibiting camping in very high fire hazard severity zones. I hope we're going to be bringing that back. I know we suspended it in March or April. Um, comments, I, like others, I appreciate all the comments. I, I don't know who Mr. Pearson is. I don't know why he thinks the city would be inclined to turn over property that we spent a lot of money on for recreational purposes or other purposes that the community wants in order to provide affordable housing. But I guess I'm, I'm not close to hearing what he has to say, but that seemed to me to be a kind of odd request. Um, the two issues I think that, that got the most, well, the bringing back live meetings. Look, I mean, you know, the one live meeting we had a few, about a month ago was great. I, I commented then it was it was great to see people up close and personal and I, I thought there was better rapport. But you know, again, we still we refuse to put the camera on and let our residents be seen on Zoom. I've been participating, everyone in the world's been participating in Zoom meetings for the past two years. And they're they're actually getting to be pretty familiar and pretty easy. But this is the only place that I participate in Zoom meetings where I can't see the people I'm participating with. It's 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 absurd. Um also, you know, the comment was made that it was great to see Captain C2I had made the same comment and that it was much more comprehensive was I think Norm's words. Well, she also had unlimited time to speak unlike our residents who are limited to three minutes. We don't even let them share minutes anymore. It's insane. I, I wish we would try to replicate as best we can while we're stuck with this process, as best we can replicate the live process. And you know, there was a time when I liked books better, than paper better than computers, but after 20 years of resistance, I'm used to using now a computer to read things. So people that are saying, you know, that we need to go back to live meetings, maybe we don't. Maybe if we would give this process a proper vetting with good technology and, and try to replicate the, the live meetings, um, you know, look, COVID's with us for at least another year, I would imagine, and we need to be figuring out what we're going to do. The tower, I'm, I, I hear Richard's answers, you know, it's a monstrosity. Um, some, if it, if, it, if it is a fact that every single particular about that was presented to the city and approved, somebody was asleep at the switch. And I would like to understand who that was. Um, like he said, he was on the planning commission. He doesn't recall it being presented or, you know, spe spelled out or talked about, you know, I'd like to know how this thing came to be because it is, it, it's a monstrosity. It's not something that belongs in Malibu. Um, it's also, as I understand, it's gonna be a huge profit center for the county. Um, and that's unfortunate that they're, they're gonna make a lot of money by bringing this blight into our city. Um, I think, oh, you know, Pamela's comment about a community resource officer or an ombudsman, I, I would hope that's something we could explore. Um, I don't know about a, and, and I like the idea, we can talk about that perhaps if we bring back the library fund issue. I, I, I like the idea of maybe using library funds, having that person 
stationed at the library so that that's a library expense and um, benefits the city and all the residents. So I think those are my, my comments. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Bruce. That brings us to item number three, the consent calendar. Have any items been pulled by members of the public? Kelsey. Yes, I'm checking my list right now to make sure there's nothing new. And items 3B3, 3B4, 3B7, 3B9, and 3B10 have been pulled by the public. Okay. Would any members of the council like to pull an item before we vote for the consent calendar? I have a question about an item, so I don't know if that requires pulling it or not. Uh, is it a procedural question or is it is? It, what, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a fact based question about the process that got us here. I just want to tell me what the question is, which, what the item is. Yeah, I, I, I just like to know it, it's that that's an, an approval of something for one of these special districts. Have we heard from any of the constituents of the district? I think you ought to pull that one then. Which okay. one is it? Six. 3B6. Okay. All right. So if no one else is going to pull anything, I'll make a motion to approve consent except for three items 3B3, 3B4, 3B6, 3B7, <laughs> 3B9, and 3B10. You got it. That's the motion. I'll uh, second it. Can we take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Council Member Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Bersanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item 3B3, I think. Yes, and we have one speaker for this item, Bill Sampson. Let me make sure he's still in the meeting. I actually don't see Bill Sampson in the meeting any longer, and he was the only speaker, so that concludes public comment. Um, I'll make a motion to approve it, and unless, of course, there's discussion. We have a, a motion second. and a second to approve 3B3. Elsie, will you take the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Uh, that's a yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, now that brings us to 3B4, and there was a member of the public that pulled that, I believe. Yes, we have one speaker signed up. Craig Hill, and we'll hear from him now. Craig, are you available? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. Hi, everybody again. Um, yeah, like we've sort of been talking about this off and on all night already, but um, just to kind of elaborate, there's, there's good reasons to be live in person. There are good reasons to be uh, on Zoom. And couple months ago, you guys kind of narrowed it right down to, you know what, it's, uh, my impression anyway was hybrid meetings. That's really the one best way to go. We could have the best of both worlds. And you asked, how long would it take to work that out? Understanding that a lot of other places and municipalities are doing it already. Um, and, I, and Kelsey said, oh, well, and I'm paraphrasing, um, it might take about a month to figure that out and put that together. And you all kind of nodded your heads and <laughs> moved on. So I think uh, it would be good to uh, agendize that to actually get staff to go out and give a report on what a hybrid meeting would look like. And, you know, personally, I prefer the Zoom. It's easier for me in some ways, but I understand the value of the in-person and I'm, you know, be happy to do that if that's, if that's the way to go, um, which obviously if we're doing hybrid, then all of us are in person. So anyway, um, those are my two cents on that. Hopefully um, we can just look better at what hybrid actually means. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Do I have a motion to approve? Oh, Bruce. Yeah, so look, I, I, I think in response to Craig's point, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to be investigating what a hybrid motion, hybrid meeting would look like and how we could accomplish it. But just so everyone understands that's watching this this meeting, a hybrid meeting means all of the 
um, council members, and in the cases of the commissions, all the commissioners need to be together live. Um, the hybrid is, is for the public. So, you know, right now we are still in a health crisis and things are not getting better. They, 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 they're yo-yoing. They, they get better, then they get worse, and they get better, and they get worse again. We're still in the worse. So um, I, I don't sense that any of us are inclined, or at least the majority of us aren't inclined to vote to come back live ourselves. So hybrid doesn't exist. This is not an option while that's the case, but hybrid probably should be on the table for when we're ready to go back live. But this motion is, right now, this, this, this point is just to make the findings required for us to stay um, not live as a council. And the findings are non-controversial. All it requires is that there be a recommendation for social distancing and other safety precautions by the county when there clearly is such a precaution. So all we're doing is confirming reality. I'll make a motion to approve this one. I'll, I'll second, second it. it. Huh? We tied, you win. All right, Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Yarine? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to 3B6. And uh, Bruce, I believe you had a question about the uh, Community Facilities District for Carbon Beach Utilities. Yeah, the, the question is simple. The, 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 the blurb description of this item is that we acting in our capacity as the legislative body of the district are supposed to make a certain determination. And, you know, as a legislative body, it, it matters what the constituents have to say. And I don't know of any view of any constituent. So I was wondering if we knew anything about what they want. I can fill you in a little bit on, on what this is about. Uh, several years ago, people on Carbon Beach got together and formed a, uh, it wasn't a GAD, but it was a benefit, assess a benefit assessments district. Is that correct, Rob? It, it was um, the, the property properties along Carbon Beach got together, requested the city form an assessment district to underground the existing utilities. Um, our consultants um, that are, are experts in form and assessment districts recommended that we do a, com a community facilities district. Bonds were sold for to finance the undergrounding. And uh, this action tonight, which is an, an assessment um, to, place the, to place those assessments, which is a payback basically a loan back and paying back the, the um, bond proceeds to to for, for the work, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the, the, and the properties on Carbon Beach are the ones paying for those? Correct. Yes. And it's basically what they previously agreed they would do in getting us to form the district? Correct. It, it's been, it's, it's a constant, um, it's constant amount every, about it, you know, or, or it's a constant amount every year. It's just, it's a it's it's a it's a loan payment that needs to be made. Um, this action tonight gives us the ability to place those assessments on the property tax roll. Tonight it is the deadline to where we can make that action to get that in time to go over to the county to place it on the property tax. And I take nobody's objective. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, they voted on it previously by over two thirds majority. Yeah, and and, and, and this type of assessment district. Uh, um, doesn't require a a public hearing. It's a consent item. It, it's that gets that gets put out to uh, the council every year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve item three B six. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. second. Okay. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yarine? Yes. Mayor Proton Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item 3B7. And that was pulled. Yes, we have one speaker signed up for this, Pamela conley ulick and we'll hear from her now. Hi, Pamela, are you available? Yeah, I just wanted to thank the city of Malibu for being so proactive 
this pro and all the citizens who started this initiative back in 2016. Um, I'm concerned that seven, I, the reports seven transients have been killed on PCH. And I really think that this issue, um, what you're doing to, uh, to hire these outreach workers will hopefully help alleviate that. I'm so impressed. They've contacted over 4,000 people. Uh, they've housed 53 and they've helped another 318. And it's just so, I think it's good that we express gratitude for what you're doing right. And I just want to commend you and the city for stepping up. I also hope um, with the library item, I think that we can do additional services, for example, uh, maybe resume writing services, a community health, mental health officer for everybody. Um, and that's just another example of how we can be proactive in addressing mental health and, and uh, wellness in our community. And the homeless are in our community. So what you're doing tonight is very commendable. And I am just so um, proud of the city council for stepping up to do this. So thank you. Thank you. Bruce, I see your hand raised. Yes, yeah, Steve, did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Why, don't you, why don't you go ahead of me first? This time. I don't know. I just had a quick, you know, I'm, I was trying, I saw the numbers saying, you know, we, we're, we've treated over 40 or 4,000 individuals. You know, the last time we talked about this people's concern, there was some discussion that says, you know, how effective are these guys in helping us find beds outside of the city to move these uh, homeless people into? And I just, there's just no information about, you know, what have we done over the last year in terms of the number of people we've contacted, number of people we've moved? And I, you know, I, we're not going to get it tonight, I don't think, but at some point in time in the near future, if someone could at least give us that update, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Steve. Bruce? Yeah, so, so I, I want to address Pam's comments, and I have a, a general comment about this contract. Um, seven deaths, I, there, there may have actually been more um, on PCH, um, but the, the comment that this outreach is helpful to deal with that this is the outreach we've had for I don't know how many years now, those seven deaths or however many are despite the outreach. Um, I don't know, maybe there'd be 15 or 20 without it. Maybe it's not relevant to it. I just I just don't have the data or, or knowledge to know the answer to that. Um, and just, you know, I'm a broken record on this. I'm just gonna make sure I keep saying it. Um, the unhoused people in our community for the vast, for the most part with rare exception, um, they're here. They're not members of our community. They didn't come from our community and lose their homes. They came here to be unhoused in our community. And um, it's not fair that our city has to bear the burden of responsibility for other places not taking care of their community members. Um, that having been said, I, you know, I've said before that I think we have better ways to spend the money that we spend on people concerned with respect to how to deal with our unhoused but this contract, like most of our consultant contracts, or many of our, our whatever we call them, it's, it's a 10 day by 10 day by 10 day contract because it is terminable on 10 days notice. So even though it's called a two year or a three year contract, it's a 10 day contract because we could suspend it tomorrow and 10 days later it's gone. So for that reason, until we have a better solution, I'm game for having a 10 by 10 day by 10 day contract with anyone almost. So I'll move to approve this one. Okay. Sure. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second to approve item 3B7. Will you take the roll, please, Kelsey? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Yuri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. It brings us to item 3B9, which was pulled by a member of the public. Yes, we have one speaker on this item. It's Ryan, and we'll hear from him now. Mr. Embry. Uh, yes, I wanted to say I'd requested from uh, the city the first Ryland report, which was referenced in a staff report when um, a request was for another infusion of $50,000 um, so they could keep talking to the uh, the wall in Santa Monica. 
about um, separation from the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. And now that this has gone on for whatever, six years, I guess, or four, or, you know, there's been so many of these reauthorizations of more and more money to the same group. And um, I'm concerned about two things that were not answered. And one of the answers came from a school board member uh, in Malibu was if no matter what the city comes up with um, in, a, in a deal, which if there is a deal, it's gonna, there's gonna be quite a lot of benefit to Santa Monica in a deal rather than a decision by the LA County um, Office of Education that we would be paying and that this uh, deal that's being worked on by a few council members and this attorney would commit um, basically Malibu School District to continue funding the Santa Monica School District for millions of dollars over quite a long period of time. And that such an arrangement would have to come before the voters of Malibu for approval, and it just might not pass. And I would like to get an answer um, in public here from Trevor is what is the um, the impact or likelihood that a vote of the people is required? And is this just a scuttle real quick before the November election to see if we can say, hey, we, we got a deal as bad as the deal may end up being? The second is the original Ryland report that I alluded to. Now that it's what, five years old, I'd like to get a copy of it. I was written this rather rude letter from um, one of the attorneys for the city said, oh no, you can't have that report. It's the basis of what, why we want 50,000 more dollars, but you can't have the report because it's, 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 it, it's attorney client privilege because the consultant happens to be an attorney. And I'm trying to figure out here if the attorney works for BBK or not. Um, it looked like it was, a, maybe there's another consultant that's talking to the attorney at BBK all the time on what to do. So I'd like the structure at least disclosed. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Bruce? Yeah, uh, so, and you know. Mikey? Uh, in for, in and for, Karen? We're, we're, we're in this one. I mean, the, the expenses are gonna continue to be mounting unless and until we have a resolution where we stop. So um, we've made this a priority. We've been approving the expenses as they go along. Um, we have a subcommittee of Mikey and Karen who feel it's a worthwhile endeavor to continue. So as long as they feel it's a worthwhile to endeavor to continue, I'm gonna to continue to provide my support for approving these expenses. Thank you, Bruce. Mikey? Um, thank you, Bruce. Um, Ryan, um, to respect, it feels like you're kind of guessing a little bit. Um, we are, as far as we've ever been on this, it, it's looking good. We're hoping to have a deal. It's tricky. And it's not tricky because people are inept or anything like that. It's, it's, it's just, if you know the history of school district separations, they're extremely challenging. So um, I can't wait till we can you know, talk about the stuff that we've all, you know, because there's, you know, legal stuff, we, we're, you know, we're, we're not supposed to talk about it right now. It's not my wish, not my hope, but, uh, the, you know, the future of this community to, to me is at stake and having our own school district is one way we can have a real impact on, on families in Malibu. And, um, I just, I guess I just want to assure you that this team is working really, really hard and I can't wait till we can tell the whole story because it is, it is, it is tricky. And I'm really feel very blessed that we have such a great team to deal with some of the craziness. And uh, so I have to leave it at that. I'm sure Karen can put out better words, but uh, um, as soon as possible, we, we can't wait to talk to the entire city county state about this everything this is this is a big deal and um 
really, really, really hope we go over the line and really feel like we're we're hopefully very close. So thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Karen? Just to give a little bit of background, um, Ryland Business Consulting um, came on board, I think, about a year ago. So they've not been uh, part of the team until this past year. Um, just a little background. The city voted, the city council voted to be the petitioner to LACO, the LACO County Committee on School District Separation in 2017. Uh, Mikey and I got elected in 2018, and at the uh, beginning of 2019 was when the council, or maybe later in the year, the council voted as a whole on the top three priorities. And they were, as most people know, um, public safety, number one, Woolsey Fire Recovery, number two, and school district separation, number three. Um, so it, it was not just made... Uh, a priority being by Mikey and me because we happen to be the ad hoc committee members. Uh, and Bruce, I appreciate the fact that you think it's also important. Um, the alternative, staying with SMMUSD, doesn't look like a good solution to me and to uh, anybody who's spent any time looking at this. So um, just wanted to give a little bit of the background. Thank you. Okay. Should we have a motion to approve item 3B9? I so move. I'll second it. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Mayor Proton Silverstein? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, that brings us to item 3B10, which was also pulled by a member of the public, I believe. Yes, we have two speakers on this item. They are Ted Harris and Ryan. We'll hear from Ted Harris first. Hey, Ted. How are you? Hello. Hi. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions. Um, so we don't have a presentation. We just, we're just here in case there are any questions for us. So um, please let us know anything you'd like us to elaborate or um, give any background on. And, and also, okay. thank you in general for the opportunity to serve the city for um, over a decade. Um, it's really been an honor and we hope to continue to serve. Thank you, Ted. And as the other people will guess, Ted is um, a partner in uh, California Strategies. Uh, who is our second speaker? We have Ryan. Hi, Ryan. You uh, have thank you. I'd actually like to thank Ted uh, for showing up and speaking. Most of the contractors seem to just be so assured that they're going to get the work that they don't even bother showing up. Um, there's several strategy items that now would be a good time for the council to disclose what they are, um, including school separation, if that's going to be a legislative matter. Um, I did get an answer about whether there's going to be a vote. Um, I look for Trevor on that one. But the the issue of repeal of the California Vehicle Code section, which is punitive and discriminatory to Malibu and heavily impacts our budget uh, to more than about six or seven million a year, that 60% of what we pay the sheriff is by our own calculation, 60% is spent on traffic law enforcement on Pacific Coast Highway to supplant the obligation of the state highway patrol to patrol the state highway. Now, you may recall, oh, yeah, well, some legislators uh, got that section passed, 2400.6, which says we don't have to pay that, and, you know, not in the city of Malibu. We were the only city. I don't think we had California strategies then, but we were the only city so singled out in the state, and we were in the middle of disasters, uh, 93, 94 earthquake, uh, uh, 96 fire, um, and we didn't sue the state and get that, this punitive um, measure removed in the courts. And so that needs to be done or the state can give us the money and we'll just continue to pay the sheriff instead. But I think it would be much better for the CHP to concentrate on what they do best and come back to Malibu, just like they had their office on Malibu Road, which I, I think it's Pritchett Raff Realty now. Um, the second would be for Caltrans to pay for all the upgrades to all the signals and 
not expect the city to co-fund every project on Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, the, the state and Caltrans should be listening to us for our approval. Um, they should take a playbook out of the city of La Cañada that uh, they seem to get what they want. I remember the city manager there holding a press conference with a name tag for the Caltrans rep who didn't show up. That guy wasn't around in the future. Second, the um, state rangers need to patrol the state parks and the state properties, which maybe that includes the Adamson House. Um, we know that this is a deficiency that's been shouldered on Malibu for a long time. Uh, back when we had the shooter in Malibu Canyon and so forth before the Woolsey fire. Let's keep these safety issues, which they, I think they all are, CHP and related to the funding, the state rangers, and Caltrans fixing the signals and the timing. They're all safety issues and these should be marching orders for California strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Bruce, I see your hand raised. Sure. Uh, don't want to don't want to disappoint. Uh, so you know, I said we have these weekly meetings, um, and um, a gr great group of people at CalStrat. I enjoy speaking with them. We have we have good conferences. Um, I learn things. Um, I I'm not sure what value at the end of the day, if you can quantify it, the city gets from having um, lobbyists. I mean, I, when I used to work at a firm in Delaware, we, 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 we did some lobbying and we had relationships with lobbyist firms and it, it's a black box to me. I, I don't know what they do and what, I, I know what they do. I just don't know how much it influences outcomes. But I do know that um, if you influence one or two large outcomes over the course of a decade, you've more than paid for the um, cost of getting it done. And um, like I said about the People's Concern contract, this is a 10-day contract. It's the, same, it's the same thing. It's structured the same way. So um, I'm not persuaded that it's money not well spent, even though I'm not necessarily persuaded it's money well spent. And um, since it's the default that we've been with for so many years, and since we could change it if we reach a different conclusion, I support it. So uh, with that having said, I'll, I'll, I'll move to approve this. I'd like to second it and throw in the fact that I've found them to be invaluable as far as getting access to various people at at uh, state parks and in the uh, in the seats of decision making in Sacramento. It actually is nice to bring something up and have a conversation ensue with somebody who is you know, one of the decision makers instead of the people we're normally dealing with. So I, whether that makes whether that changes the outcome or not, who knows, right? It it uh, we hope it will, and and we have somebody from state parks coming out this coming week. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna meet with them and hope that we move a little closer to our preferred outcome. Always. So. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Will you take the roll, please, Kelsey? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. That brings us to item 4A, I believe. Uh, which is Big Rock. And uh, do we have a, a report from staff? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight we're having a public hearing to place the special assessment for the Big Rock Basin Land Side District on the 2022-2023 property taxes. This action is required to be completed at this time so we have so we have the sufficient amount of time to submit the paperwork into the county and to place the um, special assessments on the property tax. Um, these assessments will be used to actually do the maintenance and operation of the dewatering system in the Big Rock neighborhood. Um, the average family um, home will be assessed nine hundred and forty-seven dollars and twelve cents 
which is an increase of about $46.39 from last year. Um, an increase in the annual assessment is allowed, is, is allowed in the assessment district based on the on the on the uh, consumer price index. And at the time, it's um, as we all know, the inflation is really high. It's over eight um, percent. However, the assessment district documents limit the amount of increases per year to five percent. So this in, this increase is only five percent from last year. Um, I also want to bring up the issue about the um, annual geology report. Yes, it, it was recently posted on our website. It, it was provided. Um, it's it, it's usually provided to the public a lot sooner. Um, this year, our consultant that who's doing the operation and maintenance on it took over from a previous consultant. Um, they were gathering all the information and data and trying to compile it and uh, put it in a meaningful uh, report. Um, they've also had some issues with um, some of their uh, monitoring equipment or, or their measuring equipment. Um, they had to go buy a new one and recalibrate and look at the data and, and catalog. So it took longer than expected to, to get that um, uh, uh, annual report. Um, I, I, I've talked to our consultants. I, I think we're in very good shape of, of providing um, that report back to the public a lot sooner. We're anticipating that uh, the, the, the new report, which will be uh, will be completed within the next couple of days of data, and that will be placed on the city's website sometime uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, just on another note on the um, annual geology report, this report kind of gives a summary and, and an outline of what actually has occurred during this during this last fiscal year. So it, it gives a, a little bit of a data and information on performance on how the assessment district was performing. Um, I also want to bring up the fact that last year, um, this, uh, council provided direction from staff to work with the community to look at different options on improving the assessment district and uh, look on how we can uh, develop a path forward on um, implementing some changes to the assessments, increasing the budget for certain items to have sufficient um, funding, looking for more improvements, and expanding the district. Um, since this last year, we've had several meetings with the, with our HOA and representatives in, in the community. Uh, we've had meaningful discussions. I, I've had meaningful discussions lately within with the property owners, um, the HOA um, members, and um, I, I have a pretty good um, idea on how what what we should proceed forward move, moving forward on uh, on um, modifying the assessment district. So with that, I, I propose to come back to council within the next two or three months, provide a presentation on on, on how, how the assessment district is forming, have our consultant who is doing the monitoring kind of give a presentation and give various options on what um, things can be done to improve it and, and get council's direction on, on the next move. So um, that, that will be coming within the next two or three months, I, I'm knocking on wood and making sure I have enough resources and time to get that. Um, but this assessment here it, it is merely placing the assessments and, and having, having the revenue placed on for um, for this upcoming fiscal year to actually do the operation maintenance. Like I said previously with, with, the, with the Carbon Beach undergrounding, um, this is the final deadline to where we can actually um, have a resolution passed and provide sufficient amount of time to get those documents to the county to place those on, the, on the assessments. Um, so with that, um, staff recommends adopting resolution 2226. Once this resolution has been adopted, staff will, will, will follow up with the documentation to place the annual assessments on the property tax. Tonight, I, I have our, our operation and maintenance consultant, along with our financial consultant, um, available for questions. Thank you, Rob. Do we have any members of the public who've signed up to speak on this? 
Yes, you have five speakers. They are Jeff Greer, Joe Drummond, Craig Hill, Eric Green, and Walter Zellman. We'll hear from Jeff Greer first. Mr. Greer, are you available? I am here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so you know who I am. And basically, bottom line, I'm for this 2226 resolution that we move forward with that. But having said that, uh, for over two years, a group of us have been working on this big water, the big rock dewatering system, which is basically covered by this assessment district. We've been working with Rob Dubow and his team for the duration. And my estimation may have been both honest and transparent in everything that they've done and all our workings with them. The dewatering initiative is focused on updating a system that has actually been working for decades. Our goal is to refine the monitoring and servicing of that system, preparing it for future decades and doing this in a timely, pragmatic and cost effective manner. We enter these final rounds of discovery and deliberation with no preconceived opinions or agenda. agendas. Time is critical here already. Uh, the shift in interest rates and inflation is having a material effect on the overall cost of the project of, of what, what could be a project here. We look forward to working with Rob, his team, and the city of Malibu in an effort to preserve the ecological resilience of this mesa we call home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Craig Hill, Eric Green, and Walter Zellman. Hi, Joe, are you available? Hi, yes, I am. And I'm on the dewatering committee with Jeff, and I agree mostly with everything he's saying. I, I understand this budget needs to be approved, but we do need a minor addition of stability results because we don't know how well the system is working. And I know Ye has discussed the LISAR data that can replace the former unreliable GPS data for a mere 20,000 a year plus 12,000 for subsequent years. So that should definitely be added to this budget before approval. Um, Ye has given this quote to our community and we'd like to take advantage of it sooner than later. And this information will also help us obtain the data required to justify a new assessment district or not. And um, so if that, I don't know if Rob can add that or not. I mean, it would be great to have that data for our community and to know where where the most need is, is in our assessment district. That would be it's not a lot of money and I think we have that. So I think that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Eric Green and Walter Zellman. Craig, are you available? There I am, yeah, hi. Uh, I agree with a lot of what's said, but I think I differ in, in some aspects. Um, Again, the, the maintenance report has only just come out. It wasn't noticed, didn't get a 72 hour supplemental agenda. Uh, without that data agendized, you can't really talk about the current need. And now we just heard there's even more data that hasn't even been published yet. So you're asking for revenue for a plan that cannot yet be known. The geology, the landslide hasn't been evaluated since 92. We have years of data on dewatering, but zero data on how stability is being affected. For some folks, it's become an article of faith that more dewatering equals more stability, but there's no basis to expect that the actual situation is so linear. A group of six geology professionals, including two from UCLA, one from USGS and several locals, all familiar with the landslide, recommended allocating some share of the annual budget to a study while continuing with some of the most critical of the proposed dewatering to be prudent. But the proposed assessment budget doesn't acknowledge that. Yay's nor does Ye's maintenance and monitoring report incorporate any of the experts' recommendations. By the way, it's labeled a geology report, it's not. But um, Ye's disregarded the, uh, for example, the geologist unanimous concern that the material on the bottom side of the slide plane plays a critical role in how slippery the slide may be, yet has never been sampled or analyzed. Um, they do recommend that some dewatering be done, but note that it would be possible to over dewater the hillside, making it less safe, and that wells already reach below sea level, so increased dewatering could lead to pumping up intrusive salt water just to redirect it back into the ocean. So the professionally responsible action would be to defer some dewatering for a year to dedicate a portion of the assessment funds to a stability study. Um, 
for example, per the recommendations, installing approximately three to six P exometers in the underlying section to obtain data on the bottom part of the slide plane. And if YE doesn't perform to these professional standards, they have liability, which may be imputed to the city. If and when a landslide in Big Rock causes damage, if the professional's recommendations have not been considered, then both YE and the city could be on the hook. So please let's take advantage of the expertise that was generously offered by the geologist to the residents of the city. At min minimum, you'd want YE to address each of the recommendations and provide some written rationale one way or the other. And uh, I know you need to get something out for the property taxes, but to, if you could continue this to August 8th, because you've got the procedural defect anyway on the noticing, um, that would also give Ye time to update the proposal and integrate whatever uh, recommendations they could from the study. Again, I, I agree mainly we should keep dewatering, but we definitely need to get the study going because nobody with expertise has any idea what's really going on up here. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And I don't see our next speaker, Eric Green, in the meeting, so we'll hear from Walter Zellman and circle back. Mr. Zellman. Okay, okay I just wanted to uh, take a moment to support the comments made by uh, Joe and Craig. Uh, I know the report has been late. I know you need to try to get it out. Um, on the other hand, those of us in Big Rock are, are concerned about some of the uh, technology and some of the issues that have been raised, and uh, if it's possible to postpone it, as, as Craig is suggesting, uh, I would support that, or at least find a way to look into some of these other issues uh, before going ahead with the final decisions on this. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Zellman. And Mayor, I still don't see Eric Green in the meeting, so that concludes public comment. Okay, can we go to the uh, Council? I'll start out if that's oh, Mikey first then. It, it doesn't matter. Um, my, my question would be uh, to Rob. Um, I mean, it's clear that for quite a while, um, the Big Rock residents wanna make changes to the assessment district. So if we approve tonight and they wanna make changes in the next few months, because of things that come up, is that where a, a new district has to be formed or can the this agreement be? Uh, modified. So if, if there's additional scope that's included in the assessment district, then a new assessment district will, that will need to be formed and modified. Uh, um, I checked that with our bond council and that's what he recommended. And he recommended if, if the scope of the work that's included in the assessment gets changed, uh, uh, yeah, a new assessment district will need to be formed or, or at least a new vote would for the, for the ch changes that are included in there. So if we, let's just say hypothetically, if we delayed this vote and made changes, we'd still have to form another district anyhow. Is that what I'm hearing? Or, or we could wrap that into the same if, district? If we delay the vote, then uh, we won't have the revenue to move forward with doing the assessment for next year. So, my recommendation is, is to approve the um, resolution and then let's move forward on modifying the assessment district. If, 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 if we come to agreement or if council comes to conclusion on what type of modifications they would like to see moving forward from that neighborhood, then we can go with that process and do, and do that. There are several different options that could be um, applied to uh, uh, the assessment district to do those improvements. There could be bonds, there can be things added to um, the district to finance those improvements right away. So it would be financing on top of that. It, it would, yeah, we would be able to kind of work something out to make sure that happens. Thank you. Okay, I, I just wanna uh, hit one thing. The, the date, that you need for the county is July the 1st. Correct. That's the start of the tax year. So they, the assessment's got to be there by the start of the tax year for starters. Correct. Okay. The other thing is Joe said that, uh, that there is, that there is a, enough of a balance to add the, to take the 20,000 
from money that's already in the account. Is that factual? Do you have that so, kind of a surplus in the account? So um, there is uh, money for operation and maintenance, and actually there is a there is budget in there for capital improvements for every year. Um, there is uh, uh, sufficient, or there is budget in for monitoring and, and looking and doing that throughout the area. Could this project absorb that and change some things around? Potentially. The issue is that um, uh, uh, this extra work or this different type of work could be outside of the scope of the work of the assessment district. So. I, I have to really look into that farther with our bond council and, and get a and have him make a recommendation if that's going to be uh, um, acceptable within the scope of work assessment. If it is, then then that's something that we can work out and, and try to figure out a way to to include that. So because that is a good um, uh, um, data to to receive to actually monitor. So I just have to make sure that that's something that would be legally allowed within the assessment district scope. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, the assessment district has been set up to, with a cost of living increase in it, which is well and good. What, what that doesn't take care of though, is over the years that the, re, the testing and reporting requirements from the uh, State Water Resources Boards keep getting more extensive and expensive. And uh, I think we're approaching the point where the only way they're gonna be able to do what has to be done and still dewater, they're gonna have to change the amount of the assessments. So, but that's coming. Correct. Okay. Steve? Yeah, just a real quick one. You know, the, some of the things that they're suggesting to get done, and you're saying to do that, we've got to do another assessment district. How long would that process take? Right? Let's. I, I mean, is it a, is it a two month process, six months, nine months? It, it 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 really depends on the complexity of what is being added to it. If it is, um, if we're not changing the boundary of the assessment district. Uh, um, then that that would be an easier thing. If we're just increasing the scope or, or changing, making the scope of work clear or, or adding some things and um, adding some budget for certain things, that could be done quickly and easily. And, and then a, a, a new engineer report will have to be created and the assessment district process will have to begin. So that part of it, if it's a really easy, if that is part of how we move forward on it, that could be done quickly. Um, I would definitely say before the spring. Okay, thank if, you. If, if we're if we're moving lightning speed and and going through, which I think we could. Okay, I'm just trying to get a sense of some of the stuff they're looking for, how long it may take to get delivered, if so, in fact we can go there. If it's if it's actually looking at studies and, and doing extensive reporting. That's going to take a little longer to do. Got you. Thank you very much. Bruce. So I, I remember when this came up last year, um, I had two comments. One was um, I, I thought this from what I could tell, this is less ministerial than it's presented as that there's there's an element of what we're doing. That's not, that's actually confirming that we agree with the plan, not just the levying of the cost. Um, and the other thing is, I remember the same situation last year as now, which is we're told if we don't approve it tonight, we blow it. And, and that's, this is not unusual. There's a lot of other things we get told that as well. And that doesn't make for good decision making because if there are problems, there's no ability to fix the problems. There's only the ability to approve it because if you don't approve it, it has, it, it, it's gone. So um, I, I, I definitely want to put a pin down and say, look, this got to stop. We have to. Steve, you're now the permanent city manager. I want to hopefully not be told again, tonight's the last time you can, the last night available to approve or disapprove this. And if you don't approve it, it's gone. We need to be able to at least have one meeting leeway so that if there's problems, they can be addressed and it can come back and we can make a decision. Because uh, our hands are tied when we get this kind of presentation. Yeah, I 100% I, I hear you. That was uh, um, all my intention to do it earlier. Um, 
apologize. It, it, well, we, just we, need to calendar, it? we just need to calendar it so that it's uh, due two weeks before it's due. Absolutely. I, I promise it, it will be different next year. Okay. Can we get a motion? Karen, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I just had a question for Rob uh, or Trevor. Um, Craig Hill's uh, statement that uh, we can't vote on this tonight because there's a violation with the noticing requirement. Is that correct? Or is that a separate issue? I don't believe so. I believe it was posted 72 hours ahead of time. You know, not all the supplemental information was out. But I believe it, it was posted correctly. Correct, Rob? Correct. Okay. I actually, I will just say, I think there's a misunderstanding by the public since our uh, agendas usually come out 10 days in advance. I think some people are under the impression that that's the legally required amount of time. Um, so that's let's correct. just state for the record. Kind of agenda is much farther than most cities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bruce? Yeah, just to follow up on what Karen just asked, because and that's right. I mean, we, we our agendas do come out way, 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 way more in advance than they're legally required to. Um, can if Craig's still on, does Craig have a specific objection based on what after what Trevor just said that we ought to clarify because we shouldn't be approving something if we don't have the power to? I'm satisfied with the answer that we do. But if Craig thinks Trevor gave a wrong answer, I'd like him to have an opportunity to explain why he thinks that and have Trevor address it specifically. Frank, are you there? We are asking him to unmute, so he should have a pop-up. He's raised his hand. Craig, you should have a pop-up um, to unmute yourself. Hi, I've heard my name a couple times, but the internet connection is dodgy, and I don't know what anybody's talking about right now, <laughs> except I heard okay, my name. So Craig, Craig, you 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 have contended that we lack the authority to approve this tonight because of some scheduling issue with the agenda. Can you articulate specifically what that is again, so Trevor can respond to it, and then if, let us know yeah. if you're satisfied with the answer, if you think where if you think there's still some issue. Okay. Um, yeah, it's that the monitoring, the maintenance and monitoring. Can't say we didn't try. And that is the basis on which the uh, uh, funding allocation is made on like, what have we done in the past? So what do we need to approve money to be doing now? And so my contention was that it should, there should have been a, at least 20, 72 hour supplemental report added to the agenda saying, hey, we have this report in hand, you know, you could have gotten that out on Friday. Data has been out there. Um, and for Trevor, I suspect you're not able to respond to that because yeah, I, I think I think he was trying to raise that you know there was additional information, especially in this report that um, he wanted to have come out in advance, and the, you know it's it, it would have been better to have that come out so that you know uh, there's more time for people to review it. But the notice is just to provide notice that you know to attend this meeting if you want to be able to raise issues that have been brought up here, um, and you know there was a limited time for people to see this, but. Um, you know, as you said, we're, we're pinned in here and, it, you know, normally I would say, you know, if you want to continue it to give everyone more time to look at the report, you know, go and do so, but is, I don't think we have the time. Is, is Craig saying that the information that supports the notice wasn't provided even within 72 hours? I'm not, I'm not sure what it sounded what? like that it gives the report that was was Rob, it? I mean, you talk about the there, report that, went, that that he's talking that, that Craig is referencing. I think you know what. I mean, have have we have we provided substantive information to the public subsequent to the expiration of the seventy-two hour deadline, or did everything that we provided that we're deciding this on the basis of tonight appear at least seventy-two hours ago? I, I I believe so. There was um, we had the the geology reports um, 
that were submitted to us and, and we posted them as soon as we could when the, the staff reports were due with us. So when the city turns in their staff reports to their departments to get reviewed, those uh, those reports were posted as soon as they could. Okay, but as soon as they could is not the answer to my question. Were, were, they, post, were they posted prior to the deadline that exists legally for something to be decided on at a Monday meeting? I'm trying to get that that day when they're posted. Uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking right now for that. That would be Thursday evening. Is that right, Trevor? Close the, close the business Thursday. Think, would that be the it's deadline? Fri uh, Friday. Friday? Friday, Friday at uh, 6.30. Okay, were they posted by then? Yes. Okay. Well, then it sounds. Then and Trevor, that that satisfies the legal requirement. Yeah, more than seventy-two hours. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt resolution number twenty-two dash twenty-six, levying an assessment for the maintenance, repair, and improvements works, systems, and facilities pertaining to assessment district ninety-eight dash one, Big Rock Mesa, for fiscal year twenty twenty-two. Dash 2023. Is there a second? A second. A motion and a second to uh, adopt the recommended action. Kelsey, we take the roll. Mayor Grisanti? Here, yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Ureen? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes, with a footnote that it's only because we have no choice but to approve this tonight. Motion carries. Okay. That takes us to item 4B. Do we have a staff report? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight we're having a public hearing to place the special assessments on the Cal Barco Landside Assessment District for the 2022-2023 property taxes. It's actually required to uh, 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 to be to be completed this time, so we could place the uh, special assessments on the property tax uh, uh, and prior to the county's deadline. Uh, the average single-family home will be assessed nine hundred and sixteen dollars and thirty-two cents, which is an increase of about fifty-five dollars and seventy-eight cents from last year, as as, me as mentioned previously. Um, the assessment district has the ability to to adjust the the annual assessments based on the on the consumer price index, but is limited to the maximum uh, amount that that it could be increased uh, um, to five percent. This year's increase is five percent from last year, um, and as mentioned, these this revenue will be used to operate or, or to fund the um, assessment district operation and maintenance. Um, staff recommends adopting resolution 2227. Once this resolution is adopted, uh, the final paperwork and, and documentation will be in place uh, um, on the assessment district or on, on the property taxes. And once again, I have our assessment district uh, consultants here on, on the call and I'm available for questions. Okay, do we have any public comment? No, you don't have any speakers for this item. Okay, it goes right to the council. I'll make a motion to move staff recommendation. Second. Motion and a second to move to approve this staff recommendation. Kelsey, will you be kind enough to take the roll? Councilmember Ureen? Yes. Councilmember Council Member Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item number 4C. And we have, do we have a staff report? Yes, okay. yes, you do. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, um, we're, tonight we're holding a public hearing to place the special assessments for the Malibu Road and Landside Assessment District for the 2022-2023 property taxes. Uh, um, the average single family home for this assessment district will be assessed at, at, at a value of $623.53, which is an increase of $59.38 uh, from last year. 
uh, uh, once again, that increase uh, is set at 5% from last year, and those funds will be used for the operation and maintenance of the, of the um, dewatering system on Malibu Road. Staff recommends adopting resolution 2228, and once the resolution is adopted, the final paperwork and documentation will be will be sent to the county to place the prop, place those assessments on the property taxes. And I'm available for questions. Okay, do we have any public comment signed up? No, you don't have any speakers for this item. Okay, goes to the council. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. A motion and a second to approve the staff recommendation. Will you take the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. That takes us to item number 4D. And once again, we're going to be going to Rob DeBell. Thank you. For report. Um, yeah, good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight we're having a public hearing to consider uh, the protest regarding placement of the proposed wastewater service fees for the, all the property owners within uh, phase one of the Civic Center water treatment facility on their property taxes. Uh, the proposed wastewater fees will be sufficient to cover the operation and maintenance of, of the treatment plant. Placing the, placing the fees on the property tax allows the city an efficient an effective way of collecting. Uh, um, if there is less than a majority of protests regarding the placement placement of the wastewater service fees on the property taxes, staff recommends uh, um, adopting resolution 2230. With that, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Rob. Do we have any public comment? No, you don't have any speakers for this item. Okay, Steve Urain. Uh, question, Rob. I, one, I think it was an administrative and finance committee meeting, but it could have been someplace else. They talked about the fact that we we're going to set up some kind of a, a contingency fee to deal with long-term maintenance of the wastewater treatment system to do repairs down the line. Okay. That's not been done yet, has it? it it's it, it's going to happen once we set the fees for the phase two. Phase one, I, it, it's not. It's I, I don't believe that there's any need to have a contingency fund or have a reserve amount in there to do major improvements. Yep. Um, the plan is rel relatively new. Um, and, and, but once we get the phase two on board, that's, that's a, that's a sufficient time to start. Gotcha. Those things. Gotcha. Okay. So one the second thing is, you know, we do this recycled water. How many people are actually using the recycled water? Is, is that being used by anybody? It's yeah, the city's using it. So and the city's paying for it. The yeah. City well, yeah, it, it gets the 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 uh, recycled water is, is being delivered to the uh, um, properties the same amount as they put into the system. Roughly. Okay, they're paying that whatever that fee they got to pay a fee for it though, right? Right. right. Okay, gotcha. Thank you, Bruce. What, if any, um, impact does what we're doing now have on the rates for phase two? Uh, nothing. Phase two will be evaluated based on the increased cost of operation maintenance of the treatment plant with the additional wastewater flow um, and which will include additional labor, additional maintenance, um, maybe equipment, additional uh, chemicals that needed to treat the, treat the facility and, and uh, disposal fees. And so those would be calculated and spread, a pro spread out between property owners in phase one and phase two. Okay. And um, are there any protests from anybody? I, I don't believe we've had any protests. Okay. Thanks. All right. Do we have a motion to approve the staff recommendation? I'll move the staff recommendation. I'll second it. Got a motion and a second to approve the staff recommendation. Kelsey, will you take the roll once again, please? 
Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Preston Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Item number 4E, the recommended action is to continue this item to the July 11th, 2022 City Council meeting. Is and there a That item was continued upon approval of the agenda. Okay, so we don't have to do anything to approve it. It's approved. Correct. I see Bruce's hand is raised. No, no, no. Sorry, I just didn't take it down. So we don't have to do anything with that. That takes us up to 7A. And I believe Karen Fair has the option of uh, if there are any, is there any public comment? About no, you don't have any speakers for this item. Karen, would, do you have an appointment you'd like to make? Well, um, I came up with what, what I thought were some great ideas, uh, people who could fill that spot. And to date, none of them have taken me up on this incredible offer. So uh, my search continues. You're going to have to throw in a car and a fur coat. Fake fur, of course. I'll make yeah. a motion for it to continue. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Who, sure. who, left, who, who left and under what's, and what happened? Oh, Paul Davis. It's in the, oh, it's in the it, item. I right. Yeah. I, I read that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So I guess, does that mean we put it on uh, our next agenda, Kelsey? You don't need an action, but I'll schedule it on your next agenda for you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Kelsey. Before we next, the, the next motion, the next piece of business, I, I'm going to ask that we not do it tonight. It's after 1030 and we need four votes to continue. And I think this one ought to be done early at the next meeting rather than um, now. I'd like to, I'd like to, we already continued it once. I would like to hear it tonight. I think the rule is you're not supposed to do anything after 1030. Isn't that not well, correct? No, we, we can, but we need I think four it's optional. votes. To, you need four votes out of five to proceed. Okay. How many votes do we have to proceed? Do we just take a, do we have a show of hands or does Kelsey have to take a, Take a, a vote. I think somebody has to make a motion to proceed and then Kelsey has to take a vote. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion to go ahead and start hearing item 7B. And this will be, I think, be the first item we've heard after 1030 that we have ever held a separate vote on. But Kelsey, will you be kind enough to take the roll? Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yep. Councilmember Uring? No. Mayor Proton Silverstein? No. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. And that motion uh, did not have a super majority and would fail. Okay. And politics win the day. Okay. So we, now we. We, uh, we, did, we did defer some things last week too because we didn't have a four fifths okay. vote. All right, we're going to adjourn this meeting in the memory of Harry Gessner, correct? Yeah. Famous architect, surfer, uh, loving father. All oh. around nice guy. Okay. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Kelsey, would you like to take the roll? Councilmember Pearson? Uh, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. You are adjourned. Get a lot of sleep. Goodbye. Thank you all. Good night.